Well, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, sorry about the small delay that we had. Is, uh, well, my name is Eduardo Castellinoesa. I'm the curatorial uh, uh, head cr uh, creator of Media Lab Matadero. Um, it's a pleasure for me today to be here uh, dealing with our second critical studies program uh, that we are doing in the last two years, which is the, uh, called Cosmic Brains. Uh, it's framed within the context of our third lab, which is called uh, Synthetic Minds, which is our third lab that we have been doing during the last two years. Um, during this lab that started uh, in uh, July and it's going to last until February, we are exploring uh, you know, the role that human beings could play into the creation or interaction with other models of intelligence or minds, and also the power that remains in those different kinds of intelligence, how we can reshape uh, our society, but also the, the planet. Uh, within each lab, we always like to arrange uh, what we call critical studies program, which are session of uh, one during one week. We invite different kind of experts from very different kind of backgrounds, designers, philosophers, uh, artists, uh, anthropologists, economists, to think about the different topics in depth that we are dealing with each lab. Um, so it's my pleasure to come today with Ed Keller, which is uh, the leader uh, of the, and the curatorial responsible of this second um, critical studies program we are arranging called Cosmic Brain, and also one of the mentors of the Lab 03. He will be dealing along with uh, Bani Brusadi and Bogna Conier with uh, some of the projects we are developing for the, for the Lab 03. And today we kick off uh, the program of Cosmic Brains with the first round table session that we're going to do. It's the first of a series of three. We'll do one tomorrow and the next one on Thursday. That will be the last one. Um, and aside of the round tables, also you know, there are other kind of activities that are involved in the program, like a cinema cycle that I, we're going to showcase two films, um, two sci-fi films that delve into the topics that we're addressing with the whole critical studies program. Tonight, and also tomorrow that we invite you to join. And that's a collaboration with Neteca. And finally, and has somehow has the resolve of the conversation that we're going to maintain during the next few days, we'll have a symposium on Saturday where we'll deliver some of the conclusions, but also some of the discussion that we're going to be bringing into, onto the table during the next, during the next three, uh, three days. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Ed. Uh, after a long time uh, talking with him in different kind of contexts, always through Zoom, it's finally a pleasure to meet you <laughs> in person. Uh, Ed, as long as writer, researcher, musician, and architect, he has been professor of several different schools, like uh, the news centers. Also, he has teach at uh, Columbia GSAP, um, also in Cy York. Uh, and also in Parsons, if I'm not, if I'm not grown, and now is 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 running the, uh, this this program. And with Ed, when we talk, I started talking with him. He started joining and inviting like a series of different experts that we're going to meet some of them today to address the topic of of cosmic brains. Brains. We basically, and I will do like a brief introduction where it is. We are wondering if alignment with AI is possible, and in case it is possible, what kind of semiotics? do we have to bring to start creating this kind of discussion with other different kinds of intelligence? So I will leave it here because I'm sure we're going to dig dive into it in the next session. So Ed, thank you so much for joining us today. And the floor is yours. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. Um, let me get us started. So first, I, I want to thank uh, the Media Lab Matadero, Eduardo, uh, Elena, uh, Nora, Sonia, Javi, uh, the whole team here. It's an incredible honor to join the Lab 3 project this year. It, it's an incredible venue and uh, really, really urgent and worthy projects ongoing. Also, thank you to some of our key speakers who are joining us this week. Uh, Peter Watts, Julieta Aranda, and Nandita biswas Malamfi, and our other guests, David Roden joining us today, and a range of other folks, Sarah Walker and Michael Garfield joining us via Zoom to have this, uh, this conversation about synthetic minds and cosmic brains. Uh, I think what I'd like to do is introduce our guests today first, and then I'll do a, a seven or a ten minute talk to orient you to some of the themes that we're going to try to cover over the, the next four days, uh, today and the next four days. Uh, and then I will hand it off to, to Mr. Peter Watts. 
Peter is a former marine biologist. He's an author uh, of books like Blindsight, Echopraxia, the Rifters series. He also is a flesh-eating disease survivor, and in the United States at least, a convicted felon whose novels, despite an unhealthy focus on space vampires, have become required texts for university courses ranging from philosophy to neuropsychology. And indeed, when I first read Peter's Blind Sight, uh, it took me down a whole series of uh, remarkable and important paths, and David as well, I think. Peter's work is available in 24 languages, has appeared in 34 best of year anthologies, and has been nominated for 59 awards. His significantly shorter, as he says, list of 22 actual wins includes the Hugo, the Shirley Jackson, and the Seiyun. He lives in Toronto with fantasy author Caitlin Sweet, who we are also blessed to have join us today. Uh, they live with a plecostomus the size of a school bus, I don't know what that is, and a dynamic assortment of mainly feline tetrapods. And uh, I know we, we all share a, a deep love for the feline tetrapod. Julieta Aranda is joining us as well. She just landed and she's on her way here uh, from the airport. Her flight was delayed, but I will, I'll introduce everybody. Julieta Aranda is an artist and editor of Eflux Journal and co-director of the Eflux online platform since 2003. In her artistic practice, she composes sensorial encounters with the nature of time and speculative literature. She observes the altering human-Earth relationship through the lens of technology, AI, space travel, and scientific hypothesis. So these are all themes that we're going to be diving deep into today in the next few days. Working with installation, video, and print media, Julieta is invested in exploring the potential of science fiction, alternative economies, and the poetics of circulation. Her projects challenge the boundaries between subject and object while embracing chance encounters, auto-destruction, and social processes. David Roden, here on the panel. David Roden's research has addressed deconstruction and analytic philosophy, naturalism, sound, and posthumanism. His book, Post-Human Life, Philosophy at the Edge of the Human, explores the epistemological and eth ethical ramifications of speculative posthumanism. The thesis that there could be agents originating in human socio-technical systems which become post-human as a result of some technological alteration. He also writes experimental fiction and concept horror. His novella, Snuff Memories, was published by Schism Press, 2021. His new collection of fiction and theory fiction, Xenoerotics, is published this year also by Schism. Sarah Walker is joining us via Zoom. Professor Sarah Walker is an astrobiologist and theoretical physicist with research interests in the origins of life, artificial life, the detection of other worlds. Since joining ASU in 2013, she has built a highly interdisciplinary research program to tackle the origin of life problems from all sides. Her team's major contributions are in theoretical advances in the field of astrobiology, developing new approaches to the problem of understanding universal features of life that might allow a general theory for solving the matter-to-life transition detecting alien life, and designing synthetic life. At Arizona State, she's the deputy director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science and associate director of the ASU Santa Fe Institute Center for Biosocial Complex Systems. She's an associate professor with joint appointments in the School of Earth and Space Exploration and in the School of Complex Adaptive Systems. She's also a member of the external faculty at the Santa Fe Institute. Michael Garfield, also joining us via Zoom, is a paleontology futurist. Michael works at the intersection of deep time, folk tradition, emerging media, and visionary art to anchor the psychedelic transformations of our era in an evolutionary narrative that places AI in the biosphere and casts humans as a geological process. He's the host of the Future Fossils podcast and the author of How to Live in the Future. He's released over 100 hours of original music and 500 paintings and has performed and spoken everywhere from NASA, Ames, to Moog Fest, to Burning Man, to Boom, to the Dallas Museum of Natural History, and the Santa Fe Institute. So we have a remarkable lineup of folks joining us today. Uh, I'll be as brief as possible with my comments because we have uh, Peter's talk and then the conversation emerging around all of these themes. Cosmic Brains is situated inside the Synthetic Minds Lab 03 here at the Matadero. We're trying to bring cutting-edge minds working in sci-fi, philosophy, AI, neuroscience, the arts and design together in a kind of sustained interdisciplinary conversation. Uh, for me, this goes back many, many decades, conversations that I had with Ben Gertzel back in the 1980s. Ben is the founder of SingularityNet. 
and a leading a AGI developer, scientist, philosopher, and musician. It also ties together a range of conferences that I organized at the New School as the director of the Center for Transformative Media from 2012 to 2020, and always taking on the question of what the limits of the human might be. What does it mean to communicate with the alien? And as Eduardo mentioned, we're probing today and across this week whether alignment and communication with AI are feasible. This, of course, is an incredibly hot topic in the past few days. Some of you, perhaps over the weekend, were glued to the Twitter feed because of what happened at OpenAI last week. Um, incredible drama, uh, which perhaps with that drama of Sam Altman's um, you know, um, uh, expulsion and the possible um, bringing back into the fold, driven perhaps by people who are safetyists around a hard takeoff in relationship to AI. So the, the question of whether it's possible to communicate with the alien and with AI is at the core of the discussion. And the question of what it means to explore the deep time of the evolution of human sapience and to search across that evolution for parallel models that might assist us in the design of AI. These are some of the key questions that are driving us across this, um, across this conversation. We're also taking on the, the question of synesthesia and the multimodal and Im embodied approach to cognition. So I, myself, am very interested in gesture, sound design, and music, and I know that David is, is as well. And the question of what kind of cognition is formed during in active improvisation or the active perception of sound. We're asking what it might mean, ultimately, to imagine and design micro-worlds and pocket universes, whether those are toy worlds for artificial intelligence or alternate pathways and sanctuaries in the eventuality that alignment with AI and the alien is not possible. Yeah. So what did per Percy Bysshe Shelley say in Prometheus Unbound? The emerging minds of our own age are, we have reason to suppose, the companions and forerunners of some unimagined change in our social condition, or the opinions which cement it. The cloud of mind is discharging its collected lightning, and the equilibrium between institutions and opinions is now turning in a widening gyre. And I, of course, inserted that last line there. So the, the question that's at the forefront for us is what does it mean to imagine a new Prometheanism? And how do we situate the emergence of artificial intelligence in the context of language systems and meta-language systems? We could say today that our greatest challenge will be in developing communication systems that foster meaningful dialogue and mutualism with emerging AI. And this, of course, is why Peter's work is, for me at least, um, a, a, a core reference uh, in blindsight and acropraxia to some of these conversations. Is it possible to have a meaningful dialogue and mutualism with the radically non-human? And this communication, you know, if you look at the dialogues coming uh, out around OpenAI and all of the other platforms that are being developed, it aims to align humans, AI, and all non-human systems. But can it succeed? What does it mean to incorporate non-linguistic, meta-linguistic, sub-symbolic, partially semantic systems? Gary Tomlinson's work in his book, Million Years of Music, takes up the idea that across a million years, pre-modern human cognition fell out, as he calls it, as a belated emergence in the interactions between human neurophysiologies of eye, hand, touch, smell, and importantly, hearing. And so if you imagine thousands upon thousands of generations of pre-modern humans, before written language, perhaps before much of a spoken language at all, interacting with a sonic taskscape, as Tomlinson calls it. Our life world gestures then potentially played a significant neurobiological role in the evolution of the modern mind. And this pattern of cognitive development over millions of years through parallel embodied thought and action could serve as a blueprint for AI development, or at least I hope it could serve as a possible blueprint for AI development. So we can take a cue from Tomlinson's work and at this moment in history, 2023, we've tasked ourselves with the design of microworlds, pocket universes is the term I used a moment ago. They could function as sanctuaries, nurseries, prisons, or lines of flight. And so one question we could ask here is perhaps by infusing these microcosms with multimodal gestures and nurturing communication pathways between sapient and sentient beings, we could create spaces for emerging AI to grow, interact, and collaborate, conceiving universal ontologies.
That's a very optimistic take on things, and I think we'll cover some very dark territory today as well. I, to be perfectly honest, I'm not as optimistic as I sound. <clears throat> I, I did say in the brief for the, for, the, for the week, a viable cosmopolitics might ultimately be catalyzed by a transplanetary structure of feeling that unites organic and synthetic cognition. <sighs> but I don't think so. But let's look at it. So I want to comment on the Promethean scope again of this synthetic mind. And this concept map from Aliens in Green is, um, for me, beautiful and catalytic and focused on the human to non-human spectrum, which by default includes AI, even though if you look at it, we, we don't have a lot about AI. We have a lot about concept and abstraction and, and diagramming and the alien, the terrestrial, the local, the cosmopolitical. In the work of all the folks that are going to be speaking across this week, you will be able to situate their thought processes and their output across this kind of matrix of performatisms. And this kind of approach situates AI and the synthetic and the alien mind in a scale and framework, potentially, of archives and beacons for all knowledge. Human knowledge, I wrote here, but let's just say all knowledge, something that Wolfram is quite interested in. So this potentially is about different forms of translation, not only linguistic. My partner, Carlo Leitao, and I wrote something for a seminar that Julieta Aranda convened three years ago, the Summa Technologia seminars, looking at Stanislav Lem's work. Carla and I asked, we can approach the problem of translation at the ontological foundation, not only of relations between humans and AI, but also human to human and human to non-human and alien. Since broadly speaking, translatability constitutes universal system to system information and energy flow. And of course, there's a, a deep body of work that's looked at the question of what it means to design for communication with the alien. Uh, and in fact, Stanislav Lem's novel, His Master's Voice, I think should be required reading for anyone who's doing AI development. But we can also ask, what is thought and where is it? In her foreword uh, to Kavia's recent book, Logiciel, Anna Longo looks at a uh, scenario from Ted Chiang's story, Exhalation. And to summarize this briefly, an alien scientist is looking at their own mind. And the way they look at their own mind is they peer into the back of their own head. And inside their head, in their brain, are these little metal leaves that are moving around. And they realize that the leaves are moving around in a current of air. And the question then becomes, is the thought process the movement of the leaves? Is the thought process the air flowing through? Is the thought process both the movement of the leaves in this mechanical mind and the air combined. So where is thought and what is thought? I mentioned the problem of language and gesture, the sub-symbolic, the non-semantic, and working with this theme of material computation and cognition that um, is invoked by Anna Longo and Ted Chiang's story. We could say, our mind, sentience, and sapience, an emergent property. And we can look at examples again like Arrival, which we will screen tomorrow night in the film series, as a kind of case study, which merges these semantics, semiotics, gestures, and a materiality, because the heptapods are not just speaking, singing, humming, writing, but the writing itself is actually potentially a kind of a living system that invokes a temporality of language. And we can ask to link back to the, um, you know, the, the, the kind of question of the day, prompt engineering, when we make AI images or when we work with ChatGPT, we can ask, what are the notation systems on top of physical systems which blend human gesture and sense perception with a new class of ontologies of perception which we're training today as human beings in the loop and what new forms of politics are we crafting with our prompt engineering? And how can this mode of thinking, how can these set of questions be linked synesthetically to music, sound, movement, and gestures that in fact are tens of thousands of years old? So the flute that you see this person playing, dressed up like a pre-modern human, maybe post-Neanderthal but pre-modern, is a flute that might have been played 35,000 or 40,000 years ago. And it's precisely what Herzog is interested in in his film Cave of Forgotten Dreams when he shows this flute being played. 
What are those gestures, those proto-cinemas, those proto-life worlds that span tens of thousands of years? So ultimately, we can discuss the design of micro-worlds and pocket universes, perhaps, and ask what they're good for. I'll read this quote, which is literally the last line from Chish and Lu's Death's End, the uh, Three Body Problem trilogy. The message in a bottle and the ecological sphere were the only things left in the mini-universe. The bottle faded into the darkness, so in this one cubic kilometer universe, only the little sun inside the ecological sphere gave off any light. In this minuscule world of life, a few clear watery spheres drifted serenely in weightlessness. One tiny fish left out of a watery sphere and entered another, where it effortlessly swam between the green algae. On a blade of grass on one of the miniature continents, a drop of dew took off from the tip of the grass blade, rose spiraling into the air and refracted a clear ray of sunlight into space. And the image you see is a, a photograph I took of one of those closed universes which has a tiny shrimp living in it with some algae. Um, very small, literally only this big. That one had been closed for a few years when I took that picture. So those are some of the themes that we'll take up today and in the next few days. Here, here we are today. We're in session one. We're going to have three sessions. Today is Synthetic Minds, Cosmic Brains. Peter is going to lead our discussion, kick us off. Julieta is going to join us. She'll, she should be here any moment from the airport. David and I will join in person, and Sarah and Mike will via Zoom. And so we're going to take up as many of these themes as we can today. We're going to loop back through them over the next two days. Session two, looking at synthetic minds, gestures, concurrency. Session three, universal gestures, alignment, and microworlds. And as Eduardo mentioned, tonight and tomorrow night we have a film cycle. Tonight is Ex Machina by Garland, and tomorrow night is Villeneuve's Arrival. And then on Saturday we have a concluding symposium, which is going to try to wrangle all of these themes together with keynote presentations by Peter, Julieta, and Nandita. Um, so what would constitute a cosmopolitical gesture, starting from Agamben's work on the gesture? This is a question that I asked an earlier version of ChatGPT about a year and a half, two years ago. And GPT-3 philosopher replied, the gesture is not over when the handshake has taken place because one's hand can remain outstretched. This gesture therefore contains an element of potentiality for becoming actualized and so does not yet have any final completion. Very open-ended, could be optimistic, could be pessimistic, depending on how we choose to read it. So there's a quick introduction to some of the themes. A lot of provocations dropped for Peter and David and Julieta, and Sarah and Michael. And now I'm going to hand over the device to Mr. P Peter Watts. Okay, that seems to be working. Um, yeah, I, I have some thoughts on AI. Um, I'm saving most of them for the keynote on Saturday. Um, I suppose for now, suffice to say, um, in terms of the prompt injection you were mentioning, yeah. uh, I, I, I uh, recently finished a, a story called Prompt Injection for some German cultural outfit. Um, I don't know if it's out yet, um, but the, the check cleared, so I'm going to assume it is. Um, and the, the basic conclusion of that story was that when will we become as smart as AI is, is perhaps a question asked exactly backwards. It might be more intelligent to ask based on what we know about human cognition. When will we realize that we're as dumb as AI? <laughs> um, but I will save that for, uh, for, the, for Saturday. Today I'm going to be talking more about uh, cosmic brains, cosmic minds. And, and I'm coming from you, I think, kind of from a position of incompetence. Um, I certainly am not, I'm not competent to sort of tangle with, with the work of, of the other panelists, whether they're here or not. I, I don't even know if I'm competent to tangle with this, this element of cosmic consciousness or this model of conscious consciousness that, that, that Ed here has attributed unto me. Um, I have also, though, been just recently reassured that grappling with our incompetence is part of the process, so I'm going to forge ahead. What I did do a few years ago, 
is write a book called Blind Sight, which was essentially a 100,000 word towel thrown into the ring uh, on the subject of consciousness. It was made basically me saying, I give up. Uh, I was trying to come up with some kind of a functional role for consciousness. And my benchmark was always, whenever I came up with something that I thought consciousness might be absolutely essential for, the benchmark was always, can you imagine a non-conscious system performing the same function? And the answer was always yes. So blindsight was basically my way of answering the question, what is consciousness good for with beats me? As far as I can tell, it's not good for anything. Isn't that a kick in the teeth? And uh, because I'm a science fiction writer and because I like kicking people in the teeth, I put that in as the punchline of the novel because that's what you're supposed to do. And, you know, as far as, as, far as downbeat endings go, this, was a, you know, this would kick your teeth all the way back to your colon. So... I put it into the novel. I never expected anybody to take it seriously. Um, and I'm still not convinced that it's as influential as people like Ed say it is. I mean, it is, it is true that around and following the publication of Blindsight, uh, these papers started appearing in neurological literature about, about maybe consciousness isn't all that it's cracked up to be. But it's not, as like, it's not like any of those guys ever cited, you know, Watts 2006. Uh, I, way I see it, I basically just got lucky. I threw a dart at a big pile of neuroscience papers and it just so happened that there was a, you know, a bullseye behind them. And it was almost kind of a fad for a while. I remember reading in a couple of pop science journals that there was this groundswell, this backlash against the we are all just zombies movement, which presumably would not have happened if the we are all zombies movement hadn't acquired some kind of momentum. Um, but even then, it's not like I was, I didn't make that wave. I was just kind of surfing on it for a while. And then everybody got back to realizing that the world is circling the toilet bowl way faster than anybody ever expected it to. And that you basically, depending on where you live, you have to spin a roulette wheel to see whether you're going to be on fire or underwater every given time. Pandemics started taking off. The great American experiment in democracy handed the nuclear codes to an orange sociopath. And we all realized there were more interesting things to deal with. Um, we had a good run. Uh, but recently, this new model of consciousness has shown up on my radar, uh, pioneered by a dude called Carl Friston. And it's called the free energy minimization model. And it approaches the issue of consciousness from a completely different bearing that Blindsight did, but it kind of ends up in, in almost the same way. Not so much that consciousness is necessarily intrinsically maladaptive, but that it is the very at least suboptimal. And that complex self-organizing systems really try to do without it. Um, and at the same time, I've been looking at various and sundry ways that we continue to destroy the planet on a business as usual basis. And I, I am entertaining some thoughts as to how we might, you know, stop doing that. And some of my thoughts are pretty radical. You would probably even call them insane, which is fine because none of the sane strategies to, to stop this nosedive seem to have stopped or seem to have worked. Uh, anyhow, those radical solutions also seem to have some pretty interesting and, and possibly profound implications for human consciousness in their own right, assuming that, that free energy minimization isn't a totally bogus theory. Uh, so I, I thought I would actually play around with these ideas of consciousness um, today. The, the possible renewed relevance of, of later findings on my book, how it affects us in terms of our, our uh, ecological catastrophe. Um, and I'm going to incorporate uh, I think I passed, I, I, I did this to uh, Ed's class a few years back. I'm going to pass on a thought experiment I did on human uploading, which is actually probably the most, if not the only, optimistic thought experiment I have ever conducted. It's almost delusionally optimistic. But, you know, it, it's, uh, I think it's kind of fun to play with. Uh, interesting that, that Ed should finish off his talk with a, 
a line from the Dark Forest trilogy because I got my inspiration essentially when I was trying to essentially rebut use Dark Forest theory. You're probably seen these precepts before. Survival is the primary need of civilization. Civilization constantly grows and expands, but the total matter of, in the universe remains constant. And if you've read the trilogy or if you've even read the first book, you'll know that he takes those two axioms, I guess, he calls them axioms, and uh, develops a carefully constructed argument that concludes that ultimately all intelligent spacefaring races have to end up shooting each other. And I thought that that was um, a bit dark. <laughs> and, and I usually really like dark, I usually like grim, but it seems to me that there, there, there might be some flaws in the argument. And really, it comes down to, I think, civilization constantly grows and expands. If that's true, then yeah, everything else follows and we're all fucked. And the only thing that Lou has to support that claim is all of human history. And in fact, I would go back and say it's all of, you know, biological history. We would all be pest species if we could. Um, growth and expansion and competition for limited resources seem to be kind of what life is about. But supposing we could imagine a steady state civilization that did not always have to grow and expand. Supposing we could envision something that didn't have those kinds of intrinsic biological needs built into them. That's the premise that I decided I was gonna try and redirect history from. So we start from the premise and don't bother trying to read those, that fine print. I, this is a screen grab from Wikipedia, you'll never do it. I can't even do it from here and I'm looking at it from like five centimeters away. This is a codex of human cognitive biases. And we start from what's basically a truism now, a cliche is that the crux of our current apocalypse is the caveman brains are running technology godlike technology, that the world has changed radically, but we're still basically running the same brains that we've had for 300,000 years, neurologically pretty much unchanged. And yes, we do have big shiny neocortexes, which presumably could control all those midbrain instincts. But in fact, all we really use it for is to make excuses for them because it's easier. And when you strip away all the political and and religious rationalizing, you'll find that, that we behave pretty much the way deers and voles and spiders and sticklebacks behave. We're basically enthralled to the same chemicals and hormones. There are about 200 of these cognitive biases, um, ranging from the trivial to the, to the profound. One of the trivial ones is your sweet tooth. Um, back on the Pleistocene when, when high energy foods were were scarce and hard to find. It made sense to have an instinct to grab all of that stuff that you could um, because that was a pro-survival trait. And there's no way for natural selection to look forward. Natural selection has no foresight. There's no way the genes can look forward and say, hey, this is working great now. 60,000 years from now, it's gonna give rise to morbid obesity and tooth rot and diabetes and who knows what. So that's the, biology does not work like that. So that's a trivial example. A more profound example is something like hyperbolic discounting, which in its more modest form means that if you give somebody a choice between you know, $5 today and $20 in two weeks, they're more likely to choose $5 today, the immediate payoff. Uh, again, makes sense in predictable or unpredictable, dangerous environments because you cannot trust the future. The guy who promised you the 20 might be dead in two weeks because a tiger ate him or something. Um, the bad side of that is that nowadays it means we don't really believe in the future. It means that there is a hyperbolic discount in the value that we attribute to things depending on how far away they are in time. And that also means that today's inconvenience is always gonna seem more real to the gut, which makes all our decisions, than ecological catastrophe 10 years down the road. I think this is the fundamental problem that we're facing right now. We just don't believe in the apocalypse even while it's happening. 
So evolution gifted us with a huge smorgasbord of cognitive biases that helped us to survive. But biases, by definition, lie to you about the nature of reality. Uh, that's what a bias is. Uh, it doesn't matter generally because truth is not the point here. The point is fitness. And if believing a lie, believing that your child is the center of the universe, for example, when it obviously is just going to snarf pork rinds until the ceiling crashes in, who cares if that's not true? Um, if believing a lie increases your inclusive fitness, that lie will be wired into your very soul. And that's what we're talking about with these cognitive biases. And you can explain pretty much everything this way, from religion to post-coital cuddling. Um, and if you're just a bunch of, like, bipedal apes uh, wandering around on, the, on the, the savannah, that's actually okay. But when you get so powerful that you can destroy an entire biosphere, believing those lies is very much not okay. So I came up with this Fisher-Price visualization here. Uh, basically showing the point at which the utility of, of your, your brain lying to you goes down the more sophisticated the technology becomes. It starts off at a time when civilization is at risk from our environment and it ends up with the environment being at risk from civilization and it's pretty obvious where we are on that graph right now. And that's probably where we're going to stay, frankly. I mean. All the evidence points to a catastrophic collapse in the near future. By the end of the 21st century, those of us that are left are probably going to be living in the 19th century. But again, I started this thought experiment as an explicit counter to what I thought was a pessimistic outlook from the dark forest. And the dark forest model talks about interstellar conflict. You can't have a bottle. You can't have interstellar conflict without going interstellar. So there's a certain level of, of, I don't know, possibly delusional optimism based into this premise. So let us, let us forge on. Now, when you are enthralled to a bunch of, of self-destructive or even world-destructive biases, the obvious solution is to get rid of them. But that is a pretty tall order when they are basically wired into your neurocircuitry. And you're talking literally about re-editing. You're talking about rewiring human nature itself. That is not going to go over well with most people. I've played around with various ways we might do that, and I will be talking about that on Saturday as well. But it's still borderline insane to think that anyone would go for it. I mean, try getting funding for a multi-billion dollar project whose goal is to save humanity by turning it into something else. Um, but it would be possible, in theory at least, to do that kind of editing if we ever figured out how to digitize human personalities. And if we ever made it to the stage where we became an interstellar species, it might not just be possible, it might be inevitable. Um, I've thought about, as a science fiction writer, I've thought about the possibility of interstellar travel in a number of contexts. And my conclusion is that human uploads might essentially be, be essential for it for a number of reasons. Um, here's one of them. Um, Time dilation is a dead end. Apparently what happens is when you start traveling at, at high speeds, even marginally relativistic speeds, blue shift of interstellar hydrogen run, ramming into the front of your ship is enough to melt you and all of your equipment before you reach something like 20, 30% of the speed of light. Long, long, long before any time dilation kicks in. So then what you've got to deal with is a space journey travel that lasts hundreds, thousands of years to get to the nearest star. Hibernation works really well. We've got some, some, some pretty good, uh, we've made some pretty good advances on that, although the best hibernation tech we've been able to come up with so far only gives you a 90% decline in metabolism, and that's still gonna require an awful lot of life support hardware. More, more importantly, when your cells go dormant, your cell repair mechanisms um, shut down. And as a result, anybody who spends a few thousand years in cold storage is going to have their genes shredded yeah. by, by cosmic rays to the point where they're basically a tomato that has been thawed out after having been stuck in a freezer for too long by the time they reach their destination. 
you've got the idea of generation ships, which essentially involves putting in a completely self-contained, stable biosphere into a ship on its own for, again, hundreds of thousands of years. Speaking as somebody who was once a biologist, I can think of a lot of people who I would gladly put on such a voyage. I don't like any of them very much. Uh, so basically, all of this comes down to the fact that there's too much mass involved. If you're traveling, if you travel, start trying to travel to a, 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 even a nearby star system, you got the meat and you've got a vast, you got, you got megatons of mass that has to keep the meat alive. That's the problem. Um, I think that, that uh, you know, it's safe to say that the meat kills the dream. So, if you get rid of the meat, you get rid of a lot of the mass. Um, private industry is already working on a project, I think they're calling it Starshot, which basically sends a bunch of, of spaceships the size of credit cards to Alpha Centauri. Um, I think it's light sail powered. They've got, they're planning on putting a, a giant laser array on, on the, on, down in the Atacama Desert. Now, obviously, if you've got a spaceship the size of a credit card, meat's not going to fit. Electrons might. If you can digitize human personalities, you could fit it on something like that. Uh, if you've got a ship the size of an iPhone, you can make it go a lot faster. I mean, if you're using ground-based light sail um, technology, you don't even necessarily have to pack an engine. But even if you do, you can still go a lot faster than you can with anything that holds an actual human body. But that's not even necessary. You can go as slow as you like. Just slow down the system clock. A trip of 10,000 years to a digital artificial personality could last anywhere from a weekend to 100 years, depending on, you know, how fast the clock has taken over. So, and, and if you're going to digitize a soul, you know, why not edit it? Certainly, if we can copy or upload, it's kind of a magic tech anyway. If we can, if we can upload stuff, we can certainly edit it. You might not even have to worry about that visceral re revulsion that most people have. That Bernard Murth of that just ain't natural because you're not asking anybody to turn themselves into something alien. You're basically making a copy of them. So they get to like go into oblivion with their brainstem intact. Everybody's happy. Now, some people might argue that if you edit the brainstem out, if you edit out the midbrain, if you edit all these, these nasty impulses out of you, you are losing the essence of what makes you human. You're losing a lot of the emotional richness. I would argue that what you're losing is the thing that makes you a mammal. All the upper level cognitive stuff, that's the stuff that you keep behind. Um, other people might argue that if you're losing the brainstem, you're also kind of losing a survival instinct. I mean, that's why we have these cognitive biases in the first place. Um, so if you start editing the human brain too much with an I, I, with an eye to making us more objective, you could actually be taking away our instinct to survive. Mm. And I guess my response would be to that would be, yeah, I consider that a feature, um, not a bug. If long-term survival really is your goal, I think that dragging a bunch of feces-hurling tribalistic monkey instincts across the galaxy might not be the best way to go. Um, they're biases, after all. Again, they distort your view of reality. So let us entertain the possibility, at least, uh, that a certain me measure of objectivity might also be a survival trait. And it is, by definition, impossible to have both of those things, which leads to this great little set of, of um, claims, um, which I will be hitting the symposium with uh, on Saturday again, that you can aspire to objectivity or you can basically care whether you live or die. You cannot optimize along both axes simultaneously. What I'm not going to say on Saturday, though, is that if you go interstellar, that conflict doesn't matter, because if you spread your digitized self widely enough, you don't necessarily need a survival instinct to stay alive. You're basically immune to any kind of an extinction-level event short of the, the implosion of an entire galaxy. And you measure those odds against the risks we, we, um, we pose by dragging our own cavemen brains along with us into the universe, it is not, to me, all that clear that retaining the brainstem is the way to go. 
So I'm going to start with two postulates. And I'm not going to call them axioms because they are extremely iffy. The first is that technical civilizations go through a crisis phase during which primitive cognitive processes, which essentially evolved to handle very short-term problems with very local consequences, influence the advance of, or the influence the use of advanced godlike technologies, which have global consequences and extremely long-term consequences. And any kind of survival as a species, or at least as a technological species, is going to involve getting past that, that, uh, that bottleneck, that filter. Uh, the second point is that by necessity, star-faring civilizations are able to copy individual minds onto digital substrates. I'm assuming here that the laws of physics and the laws of natural selection are universal so that any alien species that, that has to deal with the same mass constraints as we do and also wants to go interstellar will probably come up with the same solution. And we don't even know if mind uploading is possible, of course, but if these two conditions are met, we can use them to classify star-faring civilizations. Um, and I'm riffing here along the same way you probably remember um, Kardashev, Nikolai Kardashev's Kardashev scale of civilizations. Um, I think the, the, the one level is you're using all the energy on a planet. The other is you're using the, all the energy of a sun, basically a Dyson sphere. The third is you have a civilization that's so advanced that it can use all the energy output of a galaxy. It's doing kind of the same thing here, but instead of classifying on the basis of energy consumption, um, I'm basing the Moravec metric on cognitive modification. Uh, this is also named for Hans Moravec. He's the only guy in the, the post-human field that actually came up with a, you want to upload your brain into a computer scenario that I could get behind, that didn't utterly creep me out and that I thought I might actually buy into. Anyway, class one, the brain stems. Basically us, organic, single system, uh, basically, wherever we go, we are going to be our own. Our own brain stems and midbrain responses are going to threaten us with extinction and and, uh, and massive destruction. Because again, apocalyptic machinery is being run by caveman brains. Uploaded. We figure out how to upload things, um, but we're not really editing them. So we're basically caveman brains in silico now. Uh, that first thing, the brainstem basically is constrained by both the filter and the bottleneck. The filter being, where are we? The filter being 0.1 here and the bottleneck being 0.2. The uploaded have passed through the bottleneck, but not the filter. So caveman brains, interstellar flight capability, still not a great idea. Modified. They're past the bottleneck, kind of working. They're making progress on the filter. Perhaps they keep their instincts around, uh, you know, to keep them sharp in matters of survival, but they've sort of deprecated the impact, the level of control. They basically are what we only pretend to be. They have instincts, but they are in control of them. Finally, group I'm calling the purified. Uh, essentially, they've dispensed with the brainstem entirely. Now, the modified, they learn to control their instincts. The purified here don't have any instincts left to control. And since instincts, by definition, exist to promote uh, the survival of the self, these things are, these beings are selfless. They are not driven to fight or to compete for resources. I expect they would probably still possess a kind of curiosity because curiosity tends to be an upper brain phenomenon. Uh, so they'd be inclined to go on existing just because it's cool and they want to find stuff out. But if not, you know, no big deal. Uh, they've seen the world through clear eyes. That's, that's important to them. They've made that choice. These are beings which quite simply have no needs. They are divorced from natural selection. If they survive, it is not because they struggle. struggle. It is because they are too cosmopolitan to be wiped out. In Darwinian terms, we are talking about something that doesn't even qualify as a life form anymore even though it's self-aware. But the catch is it probably won't be self-aware. Free energy minimization is true. They might not even qualify as conscious. This is when we come back to the way 
blindsight shits all over consciousness as an adaptive trait, and how free energy minimization may give that position a little more credibility. Now, free energy minimization makes some intriguing claims. Uh, one of them is that consciousness is basically an error term. It's something that emerges only when the internal worldview that the model, or that the brain has predicted, um, makes a prediction that doesn't match up with what the brain perceives. So when something unexpected happens, the brain wakes up. That's what consciousness is, an error term, a metric of surprise. Most of the time, the brain would rather just work on, on, um, on autopilot. The other claim that FEM makes is that uh, consciousness acts primarily as a delivery platform for feelings. Um, you know, fear, desire, uh, um, hunger, I guess. And feelings are metrics of need. And so without needs, you have no need for consciousness. Consciousness implies a survival drive because it only exists in the case of needs and you don't care about whether you get eaten by a predator or whether you can find enough to eat unless you want to stay alive. So if free energy minimization is right, we might spread across the stars as digital entities, but we would also spread across the stars as zombies. That was raised um, in the, under the auspices of the Abrahamic religions, not the Dharmic ones, so I'm completely, again, incompetent. But to my ignorant Western mind, this actually sounds a lot like the definition of nirvana without substrate. Hmm. The complete cessation of all feelings, desires, and consciousness. Now, to me, I find that personally a terrifying prospect. I kind of like being alive. I like being conscious, even if consciousness is a parasite. But apparently, you know, I don't really know anything. Apparently, over a half a billion people on this planet actually aspire to that state. So my atypically optimistic thought experiment basically ends with humanity expanding across the universe as a bunch of zombie Buddhists. And I like that. I think that's a really cute idea, um, despite my better instincts. So if you like, we can stop and we can riff off of that. Personally, though, I don't think we're ever going to get that far. Even if uploading is possible, we've got most likely about 30 years to figure it out before civilization collapses. Interstellar travel is a whole extra mountain to climb, of course. Our instincts are still in control. Our biases are still blinding us. And if we want to control that, we can't wait until we develop digital uploads. We basically have to work on the wetware. And we can, you know, make our own minds synthetic that way. I've been thinking of various ways of doing that. Um, all the way from using this little guy to force humanity off of a red meat diet, <laughs> all the way up to tweaking Parkinson's disease to destroy the religious impulse. And we can riff on those more desperate measures too, if you like, if it doesn't put you off too much, or I can just, you know, shut up and let you guys talk about something that comes from something a little less fetid than the darkest recesses of my predictive little brain. That's pretty much all I have to say. You guys can take it away. I've spoken too much now. I gotta have a. Thank you, Peter. I gotta have some water here. Also, I've got to wonder why they have like graduated. Like, are we supposed to be peeing into these or drinking out of them? Twenty-five CL. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They seriously, they've got graduations on your drinking cups. I can hear Michael laughing over there. <laughs> Julieta Aranda has joined us. Julieta, hello. Do you want to come in and sit up here? I actually, I have a, a point to jump in here because... You want the... No, no, back? it's okay. It's okay. I, have, I do have a point to jump in here because it's something I've been meaning to talk to you about, Peter, for a few years. But the first thing I, is I have to apologize that I haven't read your entire thesis, but you did your PhD thesis on thermal management in harbor seals. 
Yeah, I, I, I posit it as Max Headroom reincarnated in the body of a harbor seal, which is a reference that's going to go over everybody's head. But back in the day, it was very clever, believe me. So you know a lot about how mammals manage temperature. <clears throat> you're a scientist. You're a marine well, biologist. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, there was a lot of biophysical modeling and stuff. I was basically trying to predict the behavior of something um, based on its environment. What will it do under certain thermal conditions? And it's a lot easier to do for a harbor seal because a harbor seal is constantly trying to weigh two different media that it has to exist in. And any adaptation that improves its odds in one medium is going to screw it in another. So it's constantly walking this knife's edge. I really like your videos. <laughs> the whole corpse thing was the holes. It's like I just discovered them like the past couple of days. And that's, uh, that's part of the yeah, it's <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, you were. So, yeah, so the, the, the thing about temperature regulation is, um, and the fact that you, when you say it has to balance, you mean between being a, a mammal in water and a mammal in the air. Yeah, yeah, because oh. when you're in the water and you're, a, you're an endotherm, your main problem is you're going to lose heat and you're going to die. Mm -hmm. And your main problem when you, when you come on the land is you're, you're covered with blubber to keep you warm in the water. You cannot sweat. Mammals don't sweat or like uh, seals don't sweat. Um, they don't even pant. So you've got this, this huge, they've got this, these tiny little flipper areas that are relatively devoid of fat. So they can sort of try and use those as heat, as as heat radiators. But yeah, but yeah it's, a, it's, a, so it's a pickle they're in. Evolution sometimes you know, puts you into blind alleys. And I mean, there's a kind of porpoise that gives birth to kids that are like literally a quarter of the size of the mother. I mean, these things are going to be dead soon anyway, probably. We probably shouldn't mourn their extinction. That's just how evolution works. That's not what you were saying, though, was it? Well, the reason I bring up the, the thermal regulation is we're talking about energy availability for certain kinds of cognition. And I wonder two things. Um, one, are there models of energy? Of, and this is also a way I'm trying to, to sneak um, a kind of an opening for Sarah to jump in here because I know, Sarah, you've done a an enormous amount of work in this space. I wonder if there are alternative metrics for understanding what baseline energy is necessary for a certain form of consciousness or cognition. So for example, one, one takeaway from blindsight and echopraxia, Peter, that I've always had is Rorschach emerges possibly from a very hostile environment and didn't have the luxury energetically of being a self-conscious alien mind or civilization or organism. Therefore, it didn't evolve to do things like have jazz music or memes or all of the things that, that humans do. In fact, when it encounters humans' excess energy broadcasts, it views them as a, a kind of a hostile act of information spread. But what if there's a, another metric for energy measurement, which is orders and orders of magnitude more efficient? And, you know, the one example that I'll bring up here is very napkin sketchy. And D Hugo de Garris himself says this is very napkin sketchy. But if you imagine building a computational system at the subatomic scale, you gain many orders of magnitude of efficiency if you had the technology to build something like a computational system at a subatomic scale, at even a subquark scale. And so de Garris basically, who made an argument for the art elect wars at a certain point in his trajectory, kind of does a pivot, 360, uh, sorry, 180, a 180 pivot, and says, but you know, any sufficiently advanced civilization is going to discover that at different scales, there are orders of magnitude of energy efficiency computationally to be gained. And if the upload is possible, or maybe even we can give up on the idea of the upload. Maybe we can say, well, you know, it's been very nice living in these meat sacks, but now we have artificial cognition. And that artificial cognition can downscale to the subatomic and take advantage of the energy gains of the subatomic. Therefore, a lot of the, the kind of hurdles that we're talking about here, running on a credit card sized spaceship, I, I remember Charles Strauss took up that same idea. They, they were flying in like a Coke can sized spaceship <laughs> to reach the interstellar yeah, router. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe this is a way of reframing the entire question of predator prey relationships, resource availability, competition driving evolution. And so I, I just ask this because I know you're an expert on energy availability and I know Sarah is joining the, the conversation here as an expert in these spaces. And I just wonder, is this a way to reframe the problem 
of competition and evolution and resource availability. So that the dark forest theory doesn't have to be this elephant in the room that we have to take on constantly. So I'll just throw that out to everybody here. I mean, I would, A, not an expert. Like my PhD was in like 1992, so it's been seriously stale dated. Um, B, cute little point in terms of the energy expenditure of, of cognition. Um, I would roll my seals into basically little microwave ovens with sun lamps over them to try and with, with transmitters in their gut so I could monitor, you know, solar radiation versus, versus core temperature and stuff. And they would always get little mohawks because the things that heated up fastest first were the brains. Yes. So you'd get the, the little patch of fur uh, drying out first on the tops of their heads. I have not heard of this, this, um, I have not heard of this sort of downscaling to quantum cognition. I think it's a cool idea. I feel like I want to sort of instinctively throw out, yes, but what about quantum uncertainty and tunneling and the, the messiness that you get down there? But that's just me <laughs> pretending to know about quantum mechanics, uh, whereas I really don't. I think a, a bigger problem is when you're talking about the energy expenditures, mm -hmm. we may be conflating cognition with consciousness. Mm -hmm. the, all of these metrics that we use essentially talk about the computational architecture. And there are various ways of coming to the conclusion that consciousness is, is functionally different. It might even be independent of, of computation. Uh -huh. I mean, if you're a physical panpsychic, everything from an electron to Donald Trump is conscious <laughs> to some degree. Um, but even if you're not, um, you could argue, you know, again, based on, on Tononi's integrated information theory or based on, on FEM, which basically says, if you have needs, you're kind I, I firmly believe on the basis of stuff I've read lately that arthropods like spiders and so on have, have consciousness. It doesn't make them especially smart, mm. although some of them kind of are. We, we, I think, endlessly underestimate the intelligence of things other than ourselves. Mm. And we constantly overestimate our own intelligence. But I think it's an interesting distinction because I think you can have, if, if consciousness is in fact um, a metric of need, mm you can have consciousness, with, you can decouple those two things. And I guess my question is, the first thing we have to figure out is how expensive is consciousness after you've factored out the associated computation? You may be talking about something that's technically true, so you win the argument, but you still don't get to play jazz if you're a quantum intellect because at that point you're no longer conscious is what I'm saying. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I want to come in Dave. with, yeah, I mean, I'm really fascinated by this idea of uploading. And when I wrote Post Human Life, I had a little excursus on it. It wasn't the main topic, because as far as I was concerned, there were too many kind of sci-fi avatars of the post-human <laughs> rattling around. And obviously, you know, there are issues to do with, well, how substrate neutral is the mind? You know, will it run on stuff other than meat? And a lot of that is going to depend on, for example, whether mind is computation and if, if it's kind of medium independent in a certain way. But So let's suppose it is medium independent, so we could get a mind to run on, on silicon or some, some other kind of digital processing mechanism. Okay, so the, 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 the sense of consciousness that I'm worried about here is not necessarily, kind of, not necessarily uh, phenomenal consciousness, like simply having feels, like being able to taste ice cream or feel toothache. It's kind of consciousness in the sense that, for example, um, you know, German idealists like Kant and Hegel, and that tradition, think about consciousness as the ability to sort of reflect and understand oneself as a kind of self-interpreting. Sapience versus sentience. Sapience, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. So, because, you know, one of the worries is not so much whether, you know, one worry is that consciousness won't make it out of the mead. 
The other worry is that sapiens, as we conceptualize, won't make it out of the meat. And he, you know, and I've got a kind of skeletal argument to suggest why that may be. So the idea is that, well, we, according to some philosophers, there's no kind of possibility of a mind-brain reduction. We can't simply reduce... Uh, a mental state like believing that Lima is the capital of Peru to some particular uh, act, set of activations in some particular part of the cortex. It's, it's much more complex than that. You won't get a sort of uh, a, a neat psychophysical um, reduction that will allow you to deduce what you're thinking from what's going on in you know, across some parts of the, the nervous system. I'm just kind of taking that as a, an assumption. Um, so, let's, so let's suppose that, and, you know, that the anti-reductionists are right. It's modest materialist anti-reduction. It doesn't mean there's anything spooky about the mind. It just means that our self-conceptualization and our interpretation is not sort of simply smoothly reducible to some kind of neurophysiological language. Okay. So, that's fine, but what, what if we imagine a creature that is cap that, in a sense, is so knowledgeable about its own substrate, about, in a sense, what makes it run, that it's, it is capable of radically editing that substrate at an arbitrary grain? Well... Then, then the outlook for kind of the, the sort of psych, the, the, the belief desire psychology that we're all kind of assuming when we think about something like self-awareness, that we have beliefs, we have concepts, we have various kinds of high-level cognitive attitudes, may not last because if you can't deduce mental states from, from neural states or vice versa, then you don't know what the effect will be of, say, deleting a particular circuit in a particular part of uh, your neocortex. Um, you might... And, and the problem with that is that the... The, the, what's supposed to govern your, your, your high-level cognitive states is, is kind of some sort of rational belief fixation, reflection, not, kind of some, kind, not some kind of uh, 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 arbitrary, uh, arbitrary tinkering. So, in a sense, once you're able to intervene into your own substrate, at that level, having this high-level cognitive architecture doesn't make much sense anymore because you, you can't use it to predict what you're going to be believing or desiring even, you know, not so much in the next hundred years, but in the next week or the next few days. You, you're you're, you're, you're going to need some other way of actually, some other dif a different kind of self-model, if you like. So once you, can, once you can intervene into the self-model, um, and it becomes, if you like, opaque to you, it becomes, then it's not clear that what we've got is anything like, anything resembling a self-conscious sapient entity. Now, it doesn't mean that it'll be a zombie. I think we just don't know what kind of mind would, would run a radically plastic self-editing um, uh, entity. I, you know, I don't think it would be, con it, it, it wouldn't be self, it, not only might it not be conscious, but it might not be self-aware in the way we understand self -aware. And in that sense, it might be a radical alien, which was, a, a, you know, which, which means that in, in advocating this prospect, we're advocating for a form of life, a form of existence that we can't conceive until that exists, that, that form of life actually eventuates, which is the kind of yeah. paradox that I've sort of explored I mean, in. That's in kind of what philosophy. evolution has always done, though, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I guess my question is, is, are you talking about subjective self-insight as to how that feels? Because I can certainly, we can certainly do weird things to the brain um, in other people. 
and draw conclusions about ourselves without having, for example, if you like tweak the claustrum in a particular way, yeah. consciousness stops. We don't fall asleep. We just kind of sit there and stare vacantly into space until we untweak the claustrum and we wake up again. So there's an on-off switch in the brain. Nobody's ever done that to me, but I am aware cognitively that that's what happens if somebody would yeah. do it to me. Am I, am I missing your point? Well, I'm, no, I think, I think the idea is that this, is, that, that, that this, this, this sort of self-intervention um, would be ongoing and constant. Because we are, after all, talking about beings which have, a, which have, if you like, a virtuosos of self, uh, self tinkering, if you like. Mm. So it's, it, it, it wouldn't just be something that would be done at a kind of fairly gross level, a fairly well understood. Uh, I mean, you know, presumably we can, sure, we can observe the effects of, of say, ablating or turning off particular parts of the brain and we can see what happens but this would this would in a sense be part of the 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 the, the uh, cognitive kind of architecture of these these creatures and in fact that seems to be what you're proposing since their their, their, their technology would allow them to uh, alter their alter their minds in a very fine Brain. I mean, you're, 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 after all, you're talking about getting rid of a load of cognitive biases. That means you, you've got to understand. Yeah. yeah sorry, I'm gonna. I, 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 I mean, I, it means it, it means you, you, you know, you, you, you need you, you need to be constantly. You have the capacity to constantly target and alter um, almost any sort of element of your substrate. Yeah. So it would always be open what the effects of that would be. It wouldn't be simply a case of observing certain kind of uh, uh, um, ana anatomical functional elements and uh, 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 addressing them. We're talking about something more wide-ranging, I guess. That Are you just saying that... that sorry, sorry to interrupt you guys, yeah. but also so uh, just to let the people know that we are going to be slowly opening to, to the Russell public, but also to our guests that are in Zoom. I think, Michael, you wanted to ch jump in since a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think Sarah also has a time on that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sarah, how, I, I have till 10, which is 36 minutes. How long do you have? About the same. So go, go ahead. It's fine. Okay. Been I'm going to, I'm going to, there's a lot here, and I'm so excited to be part of this conversation and uh it feels a little nuts to me um peter i don't know if you remember but i the first book club i ever hosted for future fossils podcast was on blindsight uh and i and i gave your book actually as a christmas gift to david krakauer at the santa fe institute the first year that i i was working there i, I i've been harassing him to read it ever since um because of his his work on a fundamental theory of intelligence and his uh you know, the the observation that he's made that intelligence, inference, and, and evolutionary adaptation are mathematically isomorphic. And I was like, well, you gotta, you know, you've got to read this because he's he's also fascinated by, you know, trying to formalize stupidity. And so, you know, in this in this kind of you know, balance between, you know, why, why is there consciousness? It's like, I, so I, I want to say a few things that may come off as painfully naive to everyone else here. Um, but hopefully stimulating in some way that uh, show me where my own blind spots are. And then hopefully I can, you know, ramp this comment uh, in a way to Sarah that makes it, uh, uh, g gives her a sort of Hail Mary pass on her way out the door. One of which is uh, that, you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought up, you know, spiders uh, you know, sensory processing does seem to have something to do with interiority. You know, I, I prefer uh, talking about interiority and subjective experience as opposed to consciousness, because consciousness is so muddled semantically. Um, and then, you, you know, you've got these, uh, you know, kind of uh, contentious experimental results with uh, the blue streak cleaner RAS passing the mirror test recognizing the uh, seeming to recognize to you know biologists that it, it, it itself in in a reflective surface 
And uh, the hypothesis as last I encountered this research uh, stated was that this is because these are organisms that have to navigate their relationship with the fish that they are cleaning. They have to, they have to uh, uh, you know, model a self-other relationship in order to, you know, succeed in their ecological niche. And so I'm thinking about, uh, you know, another Santa Fe Institute researcher, Jessica Flack, who wrote this piece on, uh, called Coarse Graining as uh, Downward Causation a few years ago for the Royal Society. And uh, she, was, she was talking about, you know, primate dominance hierarchies and the way that, that uh, in a, in a dominance hierarchy, which her modeling suggests exists as a way of, uh, as a form of collective computation, as a form of uh, effectively dissipating energy through a, a social structure of organisms by mit mitigating uh, unnecessary violence, that uh, you need to know whether or not you can fight another ape, and so you're sizing yourself up, and that means not just knowing yourself and knowing the other ape, but knowing other apes' opinions of you because they're going to mob on you or the, your opponent in a contest. And so there is, you know, the origins of what, you know, at SFI uh, has matured into complexity economics, which, you know, says that you can view the, the economy as a non-equilibrium thermodynamic system in which uh, agents, as they define them, are constantly sizing up one another. And again, you know, like you said, you know, Peter, we're, we're acting on... So I think these, uh, you know, the, the, the question of uh, why we are conscious is linked to this, this question of why simulation is so sexy. Uh, and, you know, the, the idea that um, we live in association with other intelligent agents and that we are, uh, you know, we have to navigate uh, a, a competitive landscape, but also, you know, a landscape of coordination and, you know, that so much on the, the history of, of human cognition has been written about uh, language and, and intelligence in, in its modern human form as emerging from the tracking of reciprocal relationships. So, you know, there's a collectivity piece of it that comes in here. And um, then I just, I wanted to, I wanted also to say, you know, because we were talking about cosmic uh, you know, proliferation of intelligence out in, you know, into interstellar spores and so on, uh, that I'm, I'm quite fond of this third option, John Smart's transcension hypothesis, which proposes that the reason that we don't recognize uh, anything out there, and this is, this is something that I, I uh, you know, I'm hoping Sarah will pick up on when it's her uh, when she speaks here. It, uh, transcension hypothesis suggests that advanced civilizations become so preoccupied with information processing uh, and that they turn introverted, basically, that they, they become subsumed into their own virtuality. And uh, I can see this around me now. I mean, I may be just uh, lying to myself. Uh, it may be, you know, I may, I may be falling prey to my own cognitive bias. Uh, but it seems to me as though one can claim that niche construction as a, an uncertainty reduction or free energy minimization activity in hyper-successful species uh, leads to this... Uh, this kind of involution into simulated worlds and that, you know, that virtual reality is really just an extension of, you know, the, 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 the cities of antiquity, you know, the, the creation of a membrane in which a system can be regulated and an entropy can be exported. And uh, that's why, you know, uh, Peter, I always love bringing up your... Uh, I'm going to, you know, the, the, 
I'm afraid to spoil this, but the 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 coup de gras in Blind Sight, where uh, the the people living their cozy lives in virtual reality are devoured by vampires, escaped vampires. That there is this this um, this balance that I think we we also have to consider in. Uh, yeah, this basically the success of hallucinations and uh, the control and maintenance of order and the fact that uh, those systems are dependent on uh, the endogenous production of novelty and the export of entropy and that you end up with all of the, you know, the systems like uh, endless capitalist growth are, are basically optimized for the export of externalities. It's a kind of a books cooking that claims value creation where uh, you, it could be also argued that the um, really what's happening is that value is being made legible and that uh, externalities are being, are, are, are being rendered or kept illegible. Uh, and so I, and I bring this up specifically because of this, this notion that digital minds will be without needs, which is something that I'm glad, uh, Ed, that you, you brought up Accelerando by Charles Strauss, because I think Strauss in that book and in Glasshouse and in the book he wrote with Cory Doctorow, uh, The Rapture of the Nerds, uh, Strauss did a very, very good job of... Uh, as, 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 as of many other authors, uh, exploring what the, the needs do become in a society that we claim is agalmic or, or you know, post-scarcity. I think that you know, post-scarcity societies are uh, a fantasy. They're not a science fiction because you know, energy is conserved. Um, you know, we we see that in the proliferation of digital content that we are still throttled by our ability to pay attention and that attention has been preyed upon. And actually one of the most like, kind of probable things I, I see in Peter Watts's futures is that the human mind proliferates into a kind of diasporic radiation of, of uh, uh, like a permutations of possible partitioning, uh, you know, ways to, uh, to create new individuals where you're running multi-core selves, uh, attempting to keep up with uh, increasing demands on information processing. And that that, you know, maybe more than anything, I think that maybe speaks to David's comment about, you know, the, the you know, the consciousness as we know it being, uh, kind of a transitory state, but at the same time, um, you know, there's, okay, so let's see, what else? The, um, I wanted to, I, I'd like, I just wanted to, the, the Mark Soames uh, prediction error term surprise idea of consciousness, I just, I, I wanted to go on record as saying that this comports with my actual autobiographical understanding uh, that my first memory is of one of my parents' friends doing the thumb trick, this <laughs> this thing, and it blowing my two-year-old mind. And you know, like I I, re I realized that like I must have I must have shorted out and come online, and like started a sequence of auto you know serial autobiographical uh, episodic memory in an effort to make sense of this gap between the model and the experience. So, I mean, yeah, again, I don't, I don't feel like I have any kind of strong claims here, except I do think that there is a metabolic component as a uh, long-suffering psychonaut. Uh, my, my mentor and friend, Eric Davis, who uh, has published, uh, you know, he wrote Technosis and, and more recently wrote uh, High Weirdness with MIT Press. Uh, the three times I've interviewed him for, for Future Fossils, he talks about uh, metabolic ontology. He talks about, you know, the, the, what it seems like from the, you know, the phenomenology of the psychedelic experience is that, um, 
as your functional connectivity in your brain increases, you become more and more self-aware of ordinarily autonomic processes, and you have, uh, you, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a high metabolic throughput state. You become much more, uh, you know, uh, it's a, it's a, there's a, a, a phase transition in the way that Alan Combs describes states of consciousness with chaotic attractors. You move into a new attractor that is much more uh, uh, caloric and in, calorie intensive. And, uh, and, and there is, in, in this space, as Rich Doyle, English professor at Penn State, talks about in Darwin's Pharmacy, uh, Sex Plants and the Evolution of the Noosphere, which I highly recommend as one of the best books I've ever read on information theory and evolutionary biology. Um, he, he says that basically psychedelics are training wheels for transhumanism because they give people a glimpse of the of how to dissolve question like ontological questions of the self other divide and the the subject of kind of uh, you know reason and modernity into an order of a higher logical type that uh, you realize that everything is coimbricated and uh, you know you to call the Buddhist piece into this you know the the interdependent co arising becomes becomes obvious and there is some, you know, something is still there, uh, you know, to, to, to witness this, uh, you know, to, I mean, yes, maybe, you know, millions or even billions of people are aspiring to cessation, but that was the aim of Theravadan Buddhism and uh, Buddhism has since evolved to embrace one taste through Mahayana Buddhism and, so I don't know. I mean, I am, this is uh, a lot here. I, I, one more thing I wanted to say in response to David is I love this idea that the, the filter is, um, you know, one in which basically high mutation rates uh, through metaprogramming leads to, you know, volatility. But again, I think in, in, in Peter's formulation, that's an acceptable risk because you're able to, you know, you're able to uh, select like sea turtles for, you know, uh, high, uh, high error rate, uh, you know, low success rate reproductive strategies. And all I'll say in that regard is that this is another thing that's been treated very thoroughly in both science fiction and in speculative science writing by like Philip K. Dick in Total Recall and, uh, you know, John Lilly's writing about, you know, his, his uh, LSD and ketamine-based premonitions of a solid-state intelligence. And then also in the, uh, I've written extensively about the black goo as a uh, kind of metamorphic protoplasm in science fiction, a recurring trope that appears in, in films like Lucy and, and Prometheus and uh, Beneath the Skin and so on. And that there's, there is something uh, that it seems to be calling our name. And it, you know, arguably Rorschach is, is another kind of instantiation of this, this uh, fractal black goo archetype that, uh, that looms ominously on the horizon of our own evolution, saying that basically the future uh, over the event horizon of our comprehensibility as apes is one in which we are uh, so metamorphic as to be uncategorizable, except in our, uh, you know, so I, I think that there's something, there may be a through point there be, between that kind of thinking and the, the transcension hypothesis thinking that there is maybe, and again, this is where I'm saying something that's insane, possibly to a physicist like Sarah, and I'll leave, it, I'll leave you with this, Sarah, that like, I think that, you know, talking with physicists like Jeffrey West about urban scaling and, and cities becoming these like steep attractor basins of recombinant possibility, that maybe what we are going through now is, is something akin to the formation of a literal singularity and that the technological singularity is not as, uh, as loose of an analogy as we've thought that, you know, that maybe, um, you know, Caleb Scharf's data ohm is actually the event horizon wrapping 
around the human species and our technological infrastructure until we we fold it so we fold so deeply on ourselves that we fall through selfhood and into something else entirely. Um, but yeah, okay. Anyway, thank you. Um, I'm gonna try and tune in for the rest of this uh, if I can uh, after I get out of this meeting and then I'll be back tomorrow and hopefully I can catch the recording of the hour I missed. <laughs> Prove, like, knock me down. Thanks. <laughs> Fun. Um, I can jump in. Um, I, I think, Michael, I actually probably agree with your last statement more than you would naively think I would. <laughs> um, but, um, but I guess I would probably describe it differently. I think um, I'm, I'm not actually sure uh, where to start here, but I, I think some of the things that I think about as far as like why we don't observe intelligent species are much less... Um, pessimistic than some of the things I've heard today. Um, and part of it is I think we always have to think about a particular point we are in the evolution of a biosphere. And so there tends to be a lot of thinking about this particular moment being pretty unique and then sort of extrapolating, uh, you know, about what's happening now to what might be happening in alien minds or alien technologies. And I think that that's okay to do, but not entirely the best way of framing it. So I usually like to think about what are, how can we contextualize the sort of technological transformations that we're undergoing now in the context of what the biosphere has been already doing for the last several billion years? Because I think it at least helps us step a little bit outside of our anthropocentric bubble. Um, and from that perspective, I, I you know, I, I think it's pretty obvious that everything makes sense in the context of evolution, which, you know, it's a pretty obvious statement to make, but but that we actually are still evolving ourselves. And so some of the, the ways that we actually perceive the world are probably not what they will be in the future. And so the analogy I like to make is actually to think that, you know, maybe we, we, don't, we don't actually see alien life because we haven't even evolved the technologies to interact with it. And so you can think about the evolution of eyes on our planet. So like, you know, once upon a time, it wasn't possible for anything alive on our planet to see anything else, but photons, you know, receptors had to evolve in single cells and then single cell organisms evolved into multicellular organisms and evolved compound eyes. Um, and, you know, multicellular organisms with eyes evolved into societies and societies invented things like telescopes and microscopes that let us see like the smallest things in the universe that we understand right now and also the largest things. Um, and I, and when I'm thinking about the fact that we know so little about what life and intelligence are, um, it really strikes me that without a theoretical foundation to make predictions or have it not, it's actually not even about prediction. It's about understanding and explanation without an ability to be able to do that. We probably can't build the technology that will allow us to see alien life. And the analogy I like to make is just to think about theories of gravitation. Gravitation is pretty simple compared, I think, to the physics that underlies life. Um, and Einstein, you know, had to come up with the general theory of relativity um, in order to come up with our best explanation for gravity, which predicted things like gravitational waves, but it took us 100 years to develop the technology to even prove they exist. Um, and so that sort of technology of seeing to see gravitational waves is actually a really significantly advanced kind of technology, but it requires a fundamental understanding of the way reality works to even have a biosphere evolve that kind of technology of perception to be able to interact with the world that way. So I, I think a lot of what we're lacking is an understanding that technology is evolving also new ways of perceiving the world. And that's probably part of the sort of existential transition that we're undergoing. Um, and I think uh, the, the only other part point I might wanna make is just about this theme that's come up a few times about consciousness being about prediction um, and also, you know, the ways that we contextualize thinking about consciousness in terms of individual minds. And I, I also have this sort of view that's not um, necessarily, uh, you know, maybe maybe it's on the, the opposite of side of what's been said so far. And I tend to be an eternal optimist. Um, but I think... Uh, for me, consciousness is, is sort of uh, 
it's both a deeper phenomenon and not a deeper phenomenon. I don't know exactly how to articulate that, but I think um, it doesn't strike me as being about prediction. And in fact, I don't think that most of what, what biology does is about predicting the future. I think it's more about constructing it. And so you, you actually need physical systems that can build the complex world around you. Um, in order for that world to exist. Um, and I think a lot of the things that we talk about with simulation and virtualization are actually part of that construction process because we're basically trying to put more complexity into smaller volumes of space. And that requires more evolutionary time to do that. Um, and I think uh, consciousness is actually kind of a really interesting feature of that kind of mechanism that the universe has to generate novelty. Um, which emerges probably in social beings like us and consciousness is not really uh, necessarily something that becomes the individual response to sociality, but like what social systems implement in individual minds as features of like what the social system is. Um, so I don't really, I, I don't really think of consciousness as an individual level property, but more of a collective property. And it's sort of a manifestation of me as being part of a societal system that I have this experience that I do and that I'm able to communicate in the way I do. Um, and so I think neuroscience has really missed this sort of feature of consciousness. But as a physicist, I think there are some really interesting ways that you might be able to test new theories of consciousness by thinking about it as a collective social phenomena. Um, so I guess my, my points with this are there's always these ways that we talk about things at a certain point in time, and they tend to be based particularly with aliens and also thinking about other minds and our most pessimistic narratives of ourselves, But I think the main thing is that we really actually don't know how to think about ourselves from the outside or what we might look like to other beings and that we really need to kind of reframe some of the dialogue and step outside our own minds to try to think about what we are as part of a particular instance of life on a planet that is billions of years old and will hopefully continue billions of years into the future. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Sarah, thanks. You know, um, can you hear me, Sarah? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, great. Sorry, it's so funny on Zoom because it's like I lost all the room and everything, and I felt like I was talking to myself, but I see you guys now. <laughs> no, no, no. We, we, we heard all of that. Um, I just wanted to jump in here because that, that is a way for me to tie back to something that was a thread that was um, was coming up just before Michael, you jumped in. Um, and I was making a note just after David said that the self-intervention will be ongoing and constant and we would imagine virtuosos of self-tinkering. I made a quick note saying to talk about the structure of feeling and Raymond Williams' notion of structure of feeling here, not the individual, but a collective. Because the self-tinkering would be taking place on a number of different scales, one of which would be an agent which can observe itself, themselves, and, um, and modify. But then to ask the question, where does uh, sentience and sapience, where is it constituted on a collective level? And what are the, the, the actual mechanisms by which those are constituted? You know, so in my reading of Williams, again, if you take a, a kind of a case study of something like a, a, a British mining town in the, in the 60s or the 70s, and you look at the music that people listen to, you look at the bars they go to, you look at the different beers that they like to drink, look at the way that they dress, the way that they dance, the way they save their money or don't save their money, how tired they are any day that they've worked six days a week or seven days a week, you know, in, in the kind of labors that they do. Each of those actually has a kind of an energetic cost. Uh, and it also is a way that their, their sentiment is linked you know, that they're, they're really, they're, they're affect, their affective links are formed. And those are, they're, they're like quantifiable but qualifiable systems through which a kind of sentience and a, a perception of the world and a making of the world also takes place. You know, so I, I think you're better equipped, Sarah, than, than I am to, to start to add metrics to those notions of describing a, a collective sentience or a collective sapience. But that's the way that I would, I would start to approach it, you know, and, and then think, well, and then this is just kind of culture hacking, you know, how do, we, how, do we, how do we modify the self in the sense that David was talking about, you know, the virtual so of self-tinkering is someone who understands all of those intersecting forces. I mean, does that mean that someone like Brian Eno is a virtuoso of self-tinkering or Laurie Anderson is a virtuoso mm -hmm. of self-tinkering because they understand those different substrate so. intersections so well and they understand how to intervene in them yeah. to form a culture. I mean, I guess we're all to some extent, I mean, humans 
are extremely good at self-tinkering and we, we're teaching ourselves new tricks all the time through culture. And I'm, I'm kind, I mean, bouncing off Peter. I was just simply trying to amp up the weirdness by trying to imagine a kind of quant qualitatively beyond that. Not in the sense to be either a, a pessimist or an opt optimist, but to kind of see, well, you know, maybe there are limits to how we can conceptualize that trajectory. It doesn't mean the trajectory isn't there or, you know, I mean, the, the point <laughs> is, as, particularly as philosophers, we've got, you know, we're, we're stuck in a lot into, you know, fairly habitual modes of thinking about the mind and the world and the relationship between the two and what the mind is and what thoughts are and what they have to be and what there has to be to be thought at all. Mm -hmm. You know, all those, and it's all legitimate, it's all good stuff, but um, you know, sometimes you, 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 you need to test the limits a bit. Yeah. And, uh, and in a sense, what I'm suggesting is that this scenario is even more radical than perhaps we suspected because we may not have models currently for thinking about where it will go. Yeah. And, you know, so it's ethically a kind of blind spot. Yeah, I've actually been frequently appalled by... Um, the degree to which the people who are actually at the forefront of these kinds of neurotechnological endeavors don't actually know like what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. I've had, I've had um, people who are working on brain interface technology tell me that they've never heard of patents that I read about 20 years ago mm -hmm. that would actually result in people using their technology having debilitating seizures and suffering massive hallucinatory artifacts and they actually did not know that compressed ultrasound could do weird things to spike trains in the motor somatosensory cortex and like i am not an expert on this stuff like i say i read about it in wired and and when somebody who is actually you know butchering monkeys by the dozens to to hack brains says oh, this was a really interesting story. This, like, you know, taught me so much. You have to, like, wonder what their qualifications are. Like, like the, I, think you're, I think you're absolutely spot on in that we essentially need to broaden our perspective of what is possible. And I think that what you're saying is pretty much inevitable. I mean, there's that whole branch of... of there's that whole concept that, that consciousness itself, what we perceive as reality, is essentially equivalent to a computer desktop. And that, that in the same sense that you, you look at an icon and it does what you want it to do and it allows you to interact with the system, but it in no way accurately represents the electrons and the ones and zeros that yeah, you are accessing. It doesn't allow you to intervene so, into the self. I mean, yeah. so when, when I basically say you can see the world as it is or you can carry your liver die, to, to a sense, in a sense, that's absolutely bullshit because there is no way that any input mediated to a central media nervous system is going to be the way things are. Mm -hmm. Everything is an icon. Mm -hmm. And who knows what any of us look like? I mean, who knows what... <sighs> You've been taking a lot of notes. You haven't said a word. I find that threatening. I mean... Okay. I've been taking a lot of notes too. I actually was gonna use read AI to take notes on this and I just, it was a little too hectic at the start, uh, but maybe for the, the session tomorrow, I'll invite it to the Zoom. Because invite, it does, a, invite AI to the Zoom? Yeah, read.ai read is a kind of a corporate note-taking tool that takes very, very good notes on conversations in Zoom. Yeah, I'll, I'll invite it tomorrow and, and we'll, we'll use it tomorrow, yeah. There is, um, there are mods now in Skyrim that allows you to use chat GPT and speech to text and text to speech. So that you can basically take your, your sidekick in Sky. Everyone here play Skyrim? Everyone know about, yeah, just, just a, you know, fantasy world game, right? A video game, right? And you have, you have sidekicks yeah. and helpers that you can pick up and companions who generally have about 10 things they can say in the course of the game, because building dialogue trees is hard. But they've now got these things hooked up to ChatGPT. 
so that you can talk to your companion about anything under any context and they will respond intelligently in the context of what's in the environment. Bring that in. Uh, maybe we'll do that by the end of the week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> that, that's, uh, that's interesting. But that reminded me a little bit of uh, this story that happened when, uh, when Notre Dame uh, burned down. Uh -huh. The way in which, they, uh, in which it was rebuilt uh, was by using the uh, modeling. Ah! There's a red, like the light is on. Um, there you go. Ah, the mic is on now. Okay. Yep. Um, so that uh, when Notre Dame uh, was revealed, they, it was revealed by using the modeling that was used for um, Assassin's Creed. That's that's right, Assassin's Creed. Really? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so that's yeah. That just. Uh... No. Mm -hmm. Think of the possibilities. It's quite fantastic. I mean, I mean, you go to Notre Dame now. There's probably like somebody probably there's a, a Pokemon probably. Yes, like, I mean, like, like, I, I just wonder if there is, you know, like if anything came into the into the reconstruction that was not there before by yeah. the of it being in the in the simulation. So. Like it was, it would be built partially with an air to her uh, historical verisimilitude, but also mainly for gameplay, mm -hmm. right? Like, so the, the new Notre Dame is going to be like optimized for like swinging from rafters exactly. and shooting nunchuck, nunchucks at people, exactly. which, which is actually not a, not a completely irrelevant kind of environment for a house of God. Yeah, I mean, it's fitting. Yeah, no, they've, it, it's quite fitting. I'm going to have a point cloud later today out of that, if I can. But I, I want to loop back to the, um, to the question that Sarah brought up, the physicists' ways to test consciousness as a collective social phenomenon. And I want to try to link that back across some of Michael's comments. Because I keep thinking about Lem here, and I know, Julieta, this is going to is going to resonate with you, but I keep thinking about his master's voice. And one comment I made during the introduction was, I, I, I feel like anyone who's developing AI right now should read his master's voice. It just seems essential, because it's entirely about the, the almost insurmountable challenge of communicating with a non-human system, and all of the different conceptual frameworks that one might set up around alien motivations and measuring alien motivations and measuring the ways that a customization, or again, a, a virtuoso self-tinkering mm. could be embedded in a system. But it wouldn't be embedded in you and me, or us in this room. It would be embedded at a vast scale. Um, this, is, this is the premise, or one of the, the possible premises in the storyline in his master's voice. Humans intercept a signal, that's being sent on neutrinos. The signal is shown to be an artificial signal. It's repeating. The signal is partly decoded. A couple of teams who are doing the decoding make a physical substance out of the signal's information. Uh, but the conclusion of the first person narrator scientist is that that's just a kind of a belated byproduct of what the signal is really doing. And what the signal is doing is it's operating on the level of the cosmic background radiation to make life just a fractional increment more possible in our universe. Just the tiniest bit more possible. It doesn't guarantee what kind of life, doesn't guarantee where and when. It just makes it slightly more possible. And a side effect of this very, very um, precise customization of our, of our universe, not our galaxy, but our entire universe, is the fact that when you decode the signal, you can get things like you know, the, the, the devil's spawn, which can do certain things physically on Earth. But the, I think the parallel comparison that's made by the narrator is it would be like getting a human genome sequence, not knowing how to decode it, decoding part of it and getting a white blood cell and thinking like, you cracked the code. But all you got is a white blood cell. You don't have the faintest idea of what the hell everything else is doing and how interrelated all the information structures are. And it seems to me that it's really important to link that kind of scale of observation about the complexity of a system 
back to the question of customization mm -hmm. and what kind of consequence you'll get if you start enacting the customization and then link it back to what Sarah was talking about in relationship to the physicists' ways of testing consciousness as a collective social phenomenon. So I, I feel like there's, there's something here about mm -hmm. what it means to tweak the system at certain scales, to recognize that you've tweaked it. I mean, it, it, w David, when you were talking, I was, I was thinking of Cronenberg, of course, mm. because you see that in Videodrome, uh, you see that in Dead Ringers, there's an operation on the self that takes place. I mean, in Dead Ringers, an operation, literally. Yeah. Um, in Videodrome, it's, it's more like a, a kind of a, a psychedelic information stream operation but it's an operation on the self that leads to another kind of, con you know, another kind of consciousness. Max Wren thinks he's entering another reality. Of course, at the end of Videodrome, he kills himself, but we don't know if he's entered another reality or if he's just been tricked by the information flow in the system. I guess what I'm looking for, like to, to come up with a, a specific question and a conclusion, I'm looking for ways that we can evaluate the virtuoso self operations. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's interesting because I suppose I'm, I'm, I'm kind of backing myself into a corner in a way because I'm suggesting that there's a problem, you know, at a sort of high level. You know, certainly if you're using kind of, the, you know, our standard philosophical vocabulary for thinking about thinking, um, there's, a, there's a problem even, that would be a problem applying that to you know, hyperplastic systems or mm. hyperagents, as um, y you might call them, because you know, because the, the in a sense they wouldn't have any use for, for the very they wouldn't have any there'd be no value to them interpreting themselves as we interpret ourselves, and hence there would be no collective value for them interpreting each other in those terms. Both the hetero interpretation and the self interpretation would would be something else yep. um, but so I d I'm I'm not sh you know I'm not sure what what collective would even mean at mm -hmm. that at that level that's that's kind of the worry yeah. I was curious about that myself bicamerals you're bicamerals Peter uh, yeah but the bicamerals <sighs> they weren't considered a baseline I mean by definition they're a uh, I mean, the whole idea of consciousness expanding to fill the space available. The idea that, that if you were to join two people with a corpus callosum that had that kind of bandwidth, mm. um, you know, a thought would not know to turn back at the edge of one skull. It would just keep going into the other. So you would suddenly have something with twice the computation, mm. um, 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 computational mass of a, of a normal human brain. Like... I think that, like, to me, in a sense, that's almost the antithesis of a collective phenomenon because what it does is it takes a number of different entities and it mooshes them together in the same way that the two personalities that could run independently on either side of your brain, if you cut the corpus callosum, are mooshed together into a singular sure. consciousness. So, so I guess to me it's the difference between a hive mind and a mind hive. Mm -hmm. um, when When you get that kind of a connection together, you're basically not talking about us all being part of a group mind. You're talking about a single mind into which yeah. we have all been deprecated down to these dumb little lobes that no longer have our own independent awareness and don't know enough to want to get out again. Um, so I, I'd be curious as, as, as to, you know, pursuing this whole, what she means by consciousness as a collective, unless she's just talking about it, uh, the collection of cells and, and gray matter and white matter and stuff in a single brain. But I mean, that was something I wanted to, I would have been interested in, in pursuing. Maybe we still can't yeah, throughout I, the course of the rest I think, of the... I think we lost, we lost that. Yeah. I mean, there, there's this sort of idea that, you know, our, our intelligence requires a social space, that, you know, of giving and asking for reasons, to, to use Sellers' term, yeah. that, you know, that, that what we, that, the, that, spe that speech and particularly, you know, um, linguistic, linguistically based thought finds its place in in this kind of pragmatic interplay what we're doing now essentially we're we're we're, we're formatting our thoughts in a common in a common language that we all we all speak and uh, the 
you know, we're, we're thinking together, I guess, uh, and we're, we're, we're asking questions and we're bouncing them around and, you know, that, that, that and I, I'm, I've, I've been aware for a long time, I can't do this stuff on my own. You know, as much as I might fantasize about it, I can't create on my own, I can't think on my own. I always need to be doing this kind of stuff, whether it's, it, you know, in the same room with you guys or, or, or across the internet or something. I'm, I'm, I'm less when I'm, I'm simply trying to figure stuff out on my own because I'm not smart enough to, to do it. So, so this is a kind of, you know, this is collective. What we're doing now is a form of collective... Okay, but consciousness, perhaps. supposing that instead of being surrounded by other people, you just got dumped into a really cool environment with all sorts of neat animals and yeah. toxic plants and so on, I have no doubt you would find that also very stimulating. Yeah. I have no doubt you might find different answers, but you would find answers. Sure. The question is not whether or not you're interacting with fellow minds. The, interest, the, the, the fact is you're simply getting input from a diverse... Yeah, array yeah. of sources, yeah. right? And and I don't know if I mean certainly I know where you're coming from. My God, I miss grad school. <laughs> like I miss just going out for beers yeah. and and hashing stuff over with people instead of sitting at my instead of sitting on my, at my desk and, and hating people on Quora or Facebook. Um, but but I don't think that's necessarily an element of consciousness. It's a particular type of input that allows the conscious thing yeah. in here or the subconscious thing that sends the memos up to the conscious thing can utilize to come up with solutions. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a sort of argument to the effect, it um, goes back to American philosopher called Donald Davidson who arg argued that, that, that lang you know, language, is, language is kind of essential to thought because to think we need to, be, to understand truth. That is to make, you know, to, to make an assertion or have a belief involves at least, allowing that that belief might be false. So you can't have beliefs without having a grasp of truth. And you can't have a grasp of truth without having language because um, we, we, we have to be able to, to, to have a grasp of truth. We have to be able to, if you like, attribute thoughts and principles to other creatures and imagine that they might be wrong or them, they might be right and I might be wrong. But it requires, if you like, a social space to work at all. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not suggesting that's necessarily right or true, but I think it's an interesting argument. It does suggest that there's a kind of deep dependence between the ability to um, think as we're thinking and being a social creature. Now, whether you know, uh, um, now all that is, is, is actually implicitly threatened or undermined by the scenarios we've been exploring, of mm, course. Mm. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm, I'm stating a kind of conservative position here, but, but I think it's still a position worth... You all, know, it's a, stat, it's a, it's a conventional that, position. But, all I know is that, that I'm pretty sure my cats don't know language. Sure. And I also know that Doofus the cat <laughs> hates Swiffer the cat. <laughs> and Swiffer the cat hates Doofus the cat. And they both know that. <laughs> but... So, so, so they have they have an awareness. They think things through. They they internalize things. I think without any language at all. Yeah. And and many people have have basically had an idea and then struggled to put it into language to express yeah. it. One of the reasons that they told us that we had to use math in creating simulation models was because it forces you to crystallize your thinking down in a way that can be expressed. Mm. And those things like that tend to make me think that the, the concept may pre precede the, the expression thereof. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I was just thinking um, about, uh, uh, when, when, we, uh, when talking about language, um, that there is, of course, like the difference between language and communication, like what your cats are doing yeah. and yeah. what we are doing. And it made me think, I want to go back a little bit to the idea of editing. Um, so it made, it made me think about the, the gene that allegedly uh, facilitates language, which is FOXP2. Right. And which apparently we have it and parrots have it. It's uh, who, who shared. It? Parrots. Ah. Uh, like Hawk, hawks, which one? Uh, parrots. The no, no, no. Uh, hawk, but which hawks gene Fox, is it? FOXP2. FOXP2, yeah. yeah. And that's with the H, not an F. 
Hawks. I'm not, no, not a, um, um, F like a fox. fox. I've not heard of this. Yeah, fox B. B2. Yeah, B2. See, I'm not good at language either. <laughs> that, but, um, and then, so, since there is a genetic component that uh, supposedly has to do with language, what I was thinking is that when it comes to editing, would that be maybe the domain of synthetic biology? Mm. And something that happens uh, with uh, processes akin to phages or CRISPR, mm. or uh, something along those lines. The You're saying basically if you could induce, if you could, if you could edit B, Fox B2 into a mouse or a flatworm, a flatworm. Yeah. it would have, I mean, again, if consciousness is something that can be, that can exist in rudimentary mm -hmm. forms, right? Language, I mean, does Fox have anything to do with the actual creation of anatomical structures to create language or is it purely cognitive it's uh i mean like i i don't like don't quite know they it's been said that it has to do with how i mean like obviously our anatomical um uh, apparatus is nothing like uh like that of a parrot so right. i don't think right. it's, it has to do with that it's uh but if it's cognitive then like what happens you stick fox b2 into an octopus and it starts using its chromatophores to generate hieroglyphics or i have to read more about this i've not yeah. heard about this thing yeah. I, Thank I suppose you. genes do different things the same gene might do different yeah things, different sure. organs and some that they're, they're, i mean and it's definitely more than one gene i mean there's yeah. no way something that complex is going to be in, in I, I mean, we, you know, I, we, we literally just Googled this and we're talking yeah. authoritatively. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the mutation in humans of FOXP2 causes a severe speech and language disorder, developmental verbal dyspraxia. Studies of the gene in songbirds, mice, indicate it's necessary for vocal imitation. Outside the brain, it's implicated in the development of other tissues. There you go. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, so outside the brain, it's going to be doing something else. You know, but, th but this is a this is an interesting problem. I mean, I n not not at all being an expert on Chomsky, but in um, in the extraterrestrial languages book, Oberhaus makes the point vis-a-vis -vis the function of language that Chomsky made the point quite a long time ago that language is not primarily used for communication but for thinking and communication is a secondary kind of mm. function. It depends on how you're going to measure it, obviously. But, uh, you know, I also tend to imagine that thinking takes place in many non-linguistic non ways. Uh, thinking doesn't have to be something that can then be reduced to a linguistic mm. sequence and compressed and iterated by speaking or writing it. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I, I have a lot of I have a lot of doubts and questions about sure. that. Maybe it would be better to say that it's not language, but it's certain forms of complex information structure, mm -hmm. and those can happen in gestural patterns, in gene structures. They can happen in language as well. They can happen um, externally, like as an extended phenotype. This building is an extended phenotype, and I think Javi was was making a comment, someone earlier today when I arrived was making a comment that they felt the spirits of all the creatures here that had been slaughtered because it used to be a slaughterhouse. So as an extended phenotype, it had a range of different functions and architecture, of course, can be cross-programmed and disprogrammed mm -hmm. and transprogrammed to take up many, 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 many different functions. But it had a set of functions that it maintained. It was kind of like a codec. Architecture is a codec. It captures a given state of social political relationship amongst humans and, you know, creatures living next to humans and with humans. And then it, it captures that and it, transmit, it transmits those relationships to the future. It doesn't have perfect fidelity. It's not a, loss, a lossless codec. And you look at the work of architects like Bernard Chumi and you understand that the, the, the key point or one of the key points someone like Chumi's making is architecture is an extremely lossy codec. And you can do a lot of different things with architecture and it, it will not transmit with perfect fidelity the social political structure from 500 years ago to today. In certain cases though, it might. Like the layout of this room is a pretty good codec at transmitting things like audience to speaker relationship and broadcast and recording and social dynamics of the ways that we speak with each other. But that's just because we're accustomed to operating in this kind of architectural framework. But anyway, the point I'm making here is this gets back to the extended body question. Mm -hmm. 
and it gets back to how a social structure is formed, because the social structure is formed by genetically encoded habits that transmit. This is this kind of Ballardian thing, like the deep time of physical chemical crises that happened 300 million years ago that set up a particular chemical gene pathway structure in us that's still operating 300 million years later. That's one form of transmission. And there's extended phenotype forms of transmission like clothing and ornamentation, you know, the thing that my kids gave me that I'm wearing today. All of these things are a form of guaranteeing an information flow. And then there's the, the even more extended phenotype of the architecture and the sociopolitical and economic structures of the ways that we relate. So I feel like, I feel like identifying each of those pathways, I keep going back to this idea of the virtuoso intervene, the virtuoso self-tinkerer, this phrase that David, you used a, about an hour ago. I keep going back to that and thinking like, well, how would you identify the places where, to grab a line here, the structures and functions are mm. that you can lean in on and become a virtual self-tinkerer with. Function is actually very, I think you'd be, you'd be looking at a certain type of, for a certain type of complexity and that would be kind of um, some sort of, some sort of radical, some sort of, changes at, 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 a, at, a, at a sort of functional level in whatever sort of structures. I mean, assuming you can identify some sort of structures, I don't know, it might be um, Dyson spheres or mm. something you can actually, you could in principle observe from the other side of the universe. You, you, you know, if, 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 if there was some kind of basic functional changes happening over time that were of a, a kind of um, sufficiently sort of constant and, you know, to imply mm. that there's some sort of... Ma now, the best model I, ha I have for that, and I'm still trying to figure this out, is technological change on our planet, where, you know, where, in a sense, which is, a, in a sense, a story about constant kind of functional adaptation where in a sense you know something that was invented to do one thing may be used for us so I, I mean I, in an article I've got in progress I, I, I yeah I use the example of the invention of the interferometer which was initially devised to um, mm. measure ether drift mm. back in the early 20th century and is now a kind of key component of uh, inertial navigation systems but you know so some, you know, so obviously, you know, but of course it required a whole load of really smart electronics for that, for, for, for you know, for this to be adopted laser guidance systems, mm -hmm. you know, you, it's not a sort of simple kind of unidirectional push and that seems to be pretty constant in technology, you know, the technology is, 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 is you know, it's a constant game of uh, uh, exaction, if you like, Thanks, yeah, yeah. and that, that's, and that's, if you know, function, you know, sort of uh, old things being adapted for new and hitherto unpredicted functions, and it's that, 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 and that seems to be what would be, be happening in, in, in arguably in, in some, in the sort of complexity we're talking about. And in, in a sense, it already is happening, but not the level of bodies, the biological bodies, but the level of our whole socio-technical system. Mm. The trouble is, we're not very good at. at uh, at, um, at directing it or doing anything intelligent with it. It's just happening. Um, you know, and you, sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, like, and, and like, uh, I just, uh, before I forget, like, I think um, that, yes, it's happening. And one of the reasons why we are not particularly good at doing something with it is because not only ar architecture is a lossy codec, I think most of the codecs that we make mm -hmm. are lossy. Um, mm. language included, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. Yeah. things like distort and deteriorate over a couple of generations. Mm -hmm. So when we are trying to think about establishing communication with um, life other, um, yeah. we basically have a, time, a, time, a particular time scale. So <coughs> is there a way of getting out of that time scale to it as part of the editing process, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just like mm -hmm. using the cases that you, that you uh, were mentioning? Like the idea of the editive, um, you know, like um, how did you how did you put them? 
I walk, I walk in when you were talking about like brain stems uh, uploaded, modified, and mm -hmm. uh, purified, right? So, um, the, like I try to imagine that at some point in one of those four stages, um, it would require that we get past the relationship that we have right now uh, with time. I mean, like, we are terrible at long durée, right? Like incredibly yeah, bad. Yeah. I mean, I, I would, once you, I mean, the facile answer is once you're, once you've digitized, you can just turn your time clock down so that a million years passes in one day. And that makes it much easier to have hmm. a long-term um, perspective. Um, that might be another problem from the point of view of biological creatures like us yeah. observing, because maybe the process is, the process is, the relevant process is happening really, really yeah. slowly. <laughs> Well, again, they, they, got, they got the time. You know, they, again, you know. Lem, you know, played around with that mm. in terms of whether or not a waterfall is something that is an object or a process, exactly. yeah, yeah. depending exactly. on the, the yeah. speed at which yeah. you perceive it. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, the, the thing that gives me a little bit of hope about consciousness is that so far, at least in terms of the organic consciousness that we have, there seems to be sort of a, bait, a latency bandwidth limit. If you've got, if the entire system can communicate with itself over a period of like less than 400 milliseconds, you have a single coherent identity. Mm -hmm. If you split the brain so that the signals between the halves have to go like via dial up versus broadband, mm -hmm. it's a longer path and you suddenly get a singular consciousness shattering into two. So the idea. I mean, and we have no idea why this happens because we have no idea how consciousness works. Consciousness makes no sense. But if consciousness does, in fact, if, if a coherent consciousness requires, you know, a fast call response, of course, talking to each other really, really fast, you wouldn't be able to get a conscious thing that would last, a conscious entity that would be able to perceive a waterfall as a static object because that rapid communication is necessary for the subjective experience. Mm -hmm. So whether that's a correlation, not a causation, whether, whether it even matters or whether it's just an, a weird coincidence that happens to be associated with what we know about consciousness, I don't know. But it does suggest that if you wanted to make a giant brain out of ping pong balls and habit trail tubes, where you know the, the tubes relate to various synapses and the, the, the ping pong balls are... are our, uh, our ions and you make it the size of a planet, it won't be self-aware exactly. because it's a mechanical process that would take a million, you know, a thousand years to have a single thought. Yeah. But, like but a city, like a city is probably mm -hmm. not self-aware in any way that's remotely like what we, uh, what we think self-awareness is. You know, Shaviro, Stephen Shaviro picks this up in his, in his book, Discognition looking at Maureen McHugh's story, um, Kingdom of the Blind, and the setup in that story, which is a science fiction story, Stephen Chaviro, uh, for those of you who don't know, he, he writes a book called Discognition some years ago, and he pairs scientific and philosophical concepts with the kind of testing of those concepts in a parallel short story. So he looked at Peter's work, um, he looked at Maureen McHugh's, I don't remember what he paired uh, Maureen McHugh's with, in the Maureen McHugh story, there is an IT team that's maintaining a, a hospital network. And they take care of things like lights and HVAC and all of the test equipment running in the hospitals. And the IT team notices that there are things like rolling blackouts running through multiple buildings. And there's no explanation for why these rolling blackouts are happening. And in the end, they come to the conclusion that the software system has become sentient, but not really self-aware. It's really, it's like an extremely primitive mind that's experimenting with what it can do, but it hasn't reached the level where it has feedback loops that allow it to perceive itself doing what it's doing. It's just starting to wake up, and starting to wake up doesn't mean starting to wake up like you and I, where when you and I start to wake up, you, you know, it might be the kind of Proustian thing where you wake up and you don't remember where you are in the world, what room you're in, but you know you're in your body, kind of, uh, and you know you're in a bed. Uh, this is very different. There's none of the qualia and all of those layers around it. It's just an experimentation, like a super primitive mind experimenting. 
And it feels to me that there's a connection here to what we're talking about. Yeah. And Peter, I, Peter, you talked about this in your story, The Island. And there's a moment in The Island where this entity, you talk about the, the computational, uh, the, the, um, the identity limit of the entity, which is, it's, isn't it the size of a solar system in The Island? Um, well, the, the entire... I mean, what do you, I don't know what you mean by entity. The entire balloon, the meat balloon. The balloon, yeah. Is, is about, like, think, think of the ring world made out of meat, made very, very, like, think of a Dyson sphere. Yeah. Like, paper-thin Dyson <coughs> sphere that actually metabolizes and is a biological yep. organism at some point. Yeah, yep. that, that essentially encompassed the inner, solar, the inner solar system. Yep. But the thing that was thinking could only be a tiny part of that because, of course, the more it spreads out, the more you have the latency exactly. between the yeah. exactly yeah yeah it would it would be a very interesting experiment to take a human mind and to stretch it apart if one could in a yeah. kind of a vivisection operation that's impossible so that you could see at the moment where the the neurons not to stretch the neurons themselves but to stretch the, the entire ensemble. just just basically introduce a time lag yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You just yeah, yeah, you have a, yeah. you have a brain. Yeah. You take that you, you replace the corpus callosum with something that just says, "Wait for two seconds before you pass this signal." Yeah. Both ways. Um, sounds complicated. An actual neuroscience tells me, so I'm just passing this on from him, that the bandwidth of a corpus callosum, a human corpus callosum, once you factor in signal, you know, noise reduction and and signal redundancy, basically comparable to the bandwidth of this thing. So. We don't have the tiny scale, you know, microsurgical move, uh, moves yet to pull something like that off. But when it actually, when we actually do, the bandwidth is going to be trivial. We've already got that. Um, but there is, there is a paper. Switch Jabel came out in 2015, um, which argued that, in fact, I think. The actual title of the paper was, if materialism is true, the United States is probably conscious. And he was literally referring to the geopolitical entity. Yeah. I think the technical yeah. term he used was a distributed dumb entity, or a mm. DDE. Mm. Um, and as I recall, he did not factor in this whole, wait a second, dude, you gotta have a, you gotta have a fast call response time. I don't think he mentioned that at all. Yeah. But his argument was that in terms of the informational flow of complexity of all the various aspects of a country the size of the U.S. is comparable to that yeah. of a, a thinking brain. Yeah. Yeah. From what I remember, that used to be a, a an art that used to crop up in, in arguments against functionalism in philosophy of minds. So the functionalists believe that all that matters is not the kind of stuff that the mind is made out of, but the way the way the the causal, the way the causal roles of all the parts of the mind, you know, could be neurons, it could be higher level cognitive elements are organized. Mm. And that organization is fairly abstract. It's just got, you know, there just have to be certain arrows going in the right direction between the inputs and the outputs. But the actual stuff that mediates those inputs and outputs doesn't matter as long as they do it. Yeah. Mm. And, but, but then time does, you know, so then the argument, oh, well, if that's true, then if you, you arranged the chi you know, if you arranged all the Chinese or all the Americans in the right way, so each, in, in a sense, is corresponding to one of these elements, uh, you know, uh, producing the relevant outputs to the relevant inputs, then they, then it would be conscious or it would be a mind. And again... And that, you know, hence, which is supposed to be a kind of, you know, and that, since that's absurd, then functionalism... Of a certain kind is supposed to be. But I mean, is it absurd? Well, Does a single neuron in your brain know that it is part of a brain? Is a single neuron, no. is, like our brain cells aware or is yeah. it brains? I mean, we would have no way of knowing. Yeah. There might be, you know, you get all these, these people together as, as giant flow charts with and or gates yeah. and there might yeah. be something out there thinking, oh my God, they're doing it to me again, but it can't actually do anything because yeah. it has no muscular yeah. system, yeah. right? Well, mo like most of these arguments that appeal to intuition, it's pretty yeah. kind of shaky. But, but yeah, this is the problem. Like, mm. All the stuff that you can do for everything else, you cannot do for consciousness because consciousness is magic. And, mm. and 
the moment you point out with some, you know, reductio ad absurdum argument like, well, that, that just means that all the Chinese would be conscious in that yeah. configuration. The answer can always be, how do you know they're not? Yeah. And, well, and that kind of a rejoinder hardly works for anything else. But for yeah, consciousness, yeah. it's like, it's critic proof. There is, there is a, I mean, there is in, in you know, in sort of post-war philosophy, a kind of hard-nosed deflationary um, tradition about consciousness that you can trace through people like Dan Dennett and Thomas Metzinger that basically argue that consciousness is functional. You know, mm -hmm. it's just that we don't, you know, and the only reason why we don't think that consciousness is about, is, is a particular kind of very complex functional organization is that, in, is, is that it's just too complex for us to understand that it's functional. So we, we think we can imagine zombies, we think we can imagine something that would be organized pretty much like you and me with all the relevant outputs, uh, um, you know, symphonically, um, uh, symphonically organized to produce intelligible speech and, and, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. reasonable manners, you know. So mm -hmm. I could be a zombie, but in, a, but in this psychological sense, I wouldn't be eating your flesh. I'd be doing what I'm doing now. It's just there'd be no one at home. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. what people like Dennett argue is that we just don't know how absurd this is because we, 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 we just haven't got the imagination to under, understand what this kind of level of functional sophistication could produce. You know, it's yeah. our limitation. So, the, so that, that's, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I, I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed at least with the idea that, we, you know, our, as, as, as Peter was saying, adverting to the user illusion, that our, what it, our understanding of consciousness anyway from the inside from the inside is something of a cartoon. So we probably ought to be very cautious about, about these, this intuition trading, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I'm, I, I'm referring to my intuitions as well. It's just kind of a... Yeah, can... no, I mean, it, intuition is like, like gut feelings. Yeah, Again, that's... there are certain situations in which gut feelings work and there are certain situations in which gut feelings like destroy the world. And, yeah. And there's an inflection point between the two. <laughs> I, uh, I, I think in a moment, perhaps we should uh, invite other folks to, uh, to join this conversation, yeah, but... Are we supposed to go to a movie now? Uh, when when is the movie starting? It's starting at uh, it was seven, wasn't it? Is is the film screening at seven or is it at seven thirty? Um, eight. 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 Okay, we still have we still have plenty of time. I want to find a quote, Peter. You'll forgive me, from um, from Blind Sight, and uh, it's the moment where they're having a conversation. Uh, it's actually after they've had the conversation a number of times with Rorschach and the, um, they're sending their probes in and Rorschach says something along the lines of, you think nobody's at home. You oh, I know a, that one, yeah. You think I'm a black box. Uh, no, you think, you think there's, yeah, you think I'm a Chinese room. Exactly, yeah. I yeah. thought that was so creepy. I was so proud of myself when I read that. When I was like, ooh, that's going to that's gonna be a mind fuck. Yeah. Um, let's see, request information. I think, uh, do you want to start a war might be something you could see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really close to it. Everyone be patient with me. I mean, we just kind of spoiled it. We don't really need to. More shocked. Uh, there, it, there's Your a mistake. bit of... There's Your mistake, <laughs> Theseus, is another one. Your mistake, comma, Theseus, I think. Yeah. So there, um, Rorschach is saying, uh, you've, sent a, you've sent a probe in, and uh, Rorschach to Theseus, please respond. Your current heading is unacceptable. Repeat, your current heading is unacceptable. Strongly advise you change course. That's the aliens talking to the humans on their ship. And there's a probe going in. Rorschach to Theseus, please respond. Theseus, of course, is the human ship. Uh, Rorschach to Theseus, if you are unable to respond, please. Holy shit. The cartoon flickered and died. I'd seen what had happened in that last instant, though. Jack, which is a probe, 
passing near one of those great phantom hoops, a tongue of energy flicking out, quick as a frog's a dead feed. I see what you're up to now, you cocksuckers. Do you think we're fucking blind down here? <laughs> Sasha clenched her teeth. Sasha's one of the humans. We know, Sarasti said. Sarasti is the vampire commanding the ship. But it, Sarasti hisses. The alien ship says, you pull that thing back right fucking now, you hear us. They keep sending the probe in. And you want to start a war, Theseus? Is that what you're trying to do? You think you're up for it? Oh, right, Rorschach said suddenly. We get it now. You don't think there's anyone here, do you? You've got some high-priced consultant telling you there's nothing to worry about. So, why did I think of this? Because, David, you were talking about the, the kind of P-zombie aspect of this. And I wanted Peter to talk about this now, too. Because, of course, this would be giving too much away. Or maybe it wouldn't. But is there anybody at home? You're asking me? I'm asking you. I thought the whole point of the novel was that we're... Us dumb meat sacks are too dumb to figure these things out. <laughs> <laughs> that's why they put a vampire in charge of the ship. And that's why the vampire himself was nothing more than a puppet of for an AI. AI. I mean, the, the, you never actually see the actual players in this chess game yep. throughout the entire... All you really see are pawns. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. I suppose Sarasti was probably a queen. Um, but yeah, I mean... I mean, no, the point, I'm going to double down on this. The point in Blindsight was that, was that no, the Rorschach complex was highly intelligent um, and completely non-conscious. Non-conscious. And, and, and I mean, I, I, I could go back and forth on it. That was always my, in, that was always my intention because I thought it was a good punchline for a novel. Um, and and then I kind of got you know because the actual you had people like Rosenthal in 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 a couple of years you know coming out with you know that consciousness had no function and I was like yes yes it's got legs um, but Carl Friston's stuff the free energy minimization model which basically argues that all self complex or all self organizing complex systems aspire to non-consciousness mm. that non-consciousness mm -hmm. makes you omniscient that that the reason you, the only reason you wake up is when something mm -hmm. unexpected happens mm. and the better your predictions the less cough consciousness you have that's really cool and it basically means that consciousness is like this curve it's a normal curve you start off you're this rudimentary flatworm or whatever and as your worldview goes your environment is more complex, you have more opportunity to be surprised by things, but then you get smart and you get super smart and the smarter you get. And I, it, it also makes perfect sense just because consciousness itself is this huge waste of metabolic resources. Mm. So of course, if you can get by without it, do so. So at some point, I mean, there's a, a story I have, which, which inspired the co-founder of Neuralink, which inspired mm. the, the founder of what's its face, Mid Journey? Yeah, Mid Journey. Mm, mm -hmm. um, whose next job, by the way, whose next main project is to try and build a, a, a hive mind. Mm. Like he just told me that in that many in, in, mm. in that many terms. That's his mm. basic next ba basic project. Mm. Um, and and yeah, the the uh, um, that story was basically about what happens when, and it's not out yet, but certain people have read it. Um, basically what happens if Neuralink works exactly as expected. Mm, mm. And for 21 seconds, the breakers fail and all brains are connected and you get this thing that exists with the equivalent of 15 million human brains mm. um, that exists for 21 seconds before they manage to pull the, 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 the breakers. But it is so smart in that time that it has already launched various legal maneuvers throughout the world to try and get itself re resurrected and various mm -hmm. things. But it is like when it's incorporated like maybe 300 brains, it's still conscious. By the time it hits a million brains, it now like nothing's, what's unexpected to something with 15 million times the computational mass of a human brain? It can predict everything instantly. And so it just goes to sleep, but, uh, and it, but it's still pretty powerful. So it's like, you know, three, four months after they've put this thing down, it's still reaching out from the grave and swatting at them because it put all these things into motion mm -hmm. in the few mm -hmm. seconds mm -hmm. that it had 
before it was so shut down because it could just yeah. see like it basically yeah. played a 12 dimensional chess game and it figured okay these are the moves these are the agents i have to set in it basically set like a myriad butterflies flapping their wings at just the right spot yep yep and then we killed it but now it's coming back and you know i have to i also have to draw a comparison here between the concept of flow state and the kind of chiksentmihai chiksentmihai notion of flow state and the idea of non-consciousness that you're talking about here because if i am not mistaken the chiksentmihai flow state is a subjective feeling that you and i might get if we're doing something like we're, we're rock climbing and we feel really like happy and in control or we're improvising a solo mm -hmm. over giant steps and we're we're just we're so in it that there's no mm -hmm. reflection there's no consciousness other than the consciousness of watching oneself play it was interesting for me actually reading an interview with pat metheny a few weeks ago mm -hmm. i wouldn't have imagined pat metheny being a musician to say this i, and I love his music mm -hmm. but he said that for him it's more like he's just watching the music he's the audience member and he's just watching the music happen. That's something that Robert Fripp said many, many, many yeah. years ago. And with Fripp, it makes sense to me because I can see Fripp coming out, uh, out of his own philosophical background and, and thinking that the musician is only really a vehicle to channel the sound. But the reason I'm drawing this comparison is most people, when they read Csikszentmihalyi and they, and they try to understand flow state, they're like, wow, so I need to be in the flow state, which means I need to feel good. And feeling good is the flow state. So it, there's a kind of a teleology built into saying like, let's get into the flow state because not only does that mean I'll play the best solo over giant steps I've ever played, it'll also feel really good. Mm -hmm. And you know, we'll, we'll talk with Elliot Sharp, the musician, I think tomorrow he'll be here with us. But I, you know, I think every musician has had this experience. There'll be moments where you're playing and you hate what is happening. You can't hear what the other musicians are doing. It's dreadful. And, you, and then there are gigs where you'll, you'll play something and you'll feel fantastic. You'll come away being like, this was a great set. This was fantastic. And when you listen to the recording of the set you hated, you suddenly realize that it was really happening. And when you listen to the recording of the set you loved and you felt really good in, you realize that things weren't happening. Now, it's a very subjective thing to say this was happening or this wasn't happening. But just to go with that for a second, I think it's a total error to say that flow state and feeling good in flow state is in any way similar to the other end of the curve that Peter, you were just mm -hmm. describing, which is you become so intelligent that you no longer are capable of even perceiving yourself, perceiving or doing anything. There are very, very different things because in, in that state of being that you were describing, I think any subjective self-evaluation of quote, feeling good or not feeling good was left in the dust a really, really, really long time ago. It's not even anywhere part of the equation. And so I think it's, it's, it's a really important point to make here because it's a categorical error to assume that feeling good or not feeling good subjectively needs to be part of this discussion. Just like <clears throat> this flow state thing, and this is, this is new terminology yeah. to me, is yeah. this the equivalent <clears throat> of just being in the zone? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm not, I was, I was, um, cause I was in Malta last week at a conference and my friend Martin Rosenberg, who works on jazz and cognition, was talking about just this and he's, he's argued on the basis of his research that, well apparently the, I mean I can't, don't quote me on this, but apparently the neuroscience on um, jazz performers suggests that they're, that their, their brains are at a very high level of integration in terms of the kind of various bits that are modulating other bits. Mm -hmm. And in cognitive terms, that seems to involve working at very different time scales. And, I'm, and as a sometime jazz musician, I'm aware of that. So that some t you know, at some level, I'm usually kind of thinking about where the solo is going in a very kind of yeah. vague sense. Is this improvisational? Yeah, stuff, if I'm or? improvising, say, round giant steps, although I, I think that in my case it would be more like a kind, might be a little more um, sedentary than, but, mm. uh, but say, you know, I'm improvising around a Miles Davis tune, so what? Something, I'm, yeah. you know, it's yeah. going quite well. So I'm thinking to some extent about the architecture of the solo, you know, maybe whether. Well, I know at some point I'm going to modulate that the, the chord sequence is going to modulate from D minor to, 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 to E flat. 
E flat minor, um, and there may be certain transitional scales that will work over both yep. keys, that will make a nice melodic sort of transition from one to the other, because uh, it's a you know it's a chromatic movement. You know the two If you just think of them as the Dori uh, uh, traditional modes, say the Dorian mode and in in, in E flat and uh, 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 D, they've got very very few notes in common, yeah. but you, you you know there are ways around that. You find your way. Yeah. So so you know there's some strategic thinking, but at the same level, at, at, at a much lower level, I, my my fingers are kind of you know respond you know my fingers are kind of bouncing off the keys and exploring movements and seeing seeing where those movements go and maybe you know and I I'm not consciously able to monitor that it's it's a mixture of kind of you know of habit of training yeah. muscle memory if you like all that sort of, and and simply responding also responding to the instrument and what it's the feedback from the instrument so it's all this stuff going back at, going on at different sort of scales of awareness um, and yeah, if you try, if you try to think too much about what's happening at the sort of shortest scale, you're going to screw up. And it, that may be because you're you're you're, you're reallocating resources. Mm. I don't know. There are certain mm. models of cognition that could, mm. you know. Mm. You, you, I mean, you that, that also probably has to do with the fact that music is definitely not language, right? Yeah. So if you try to uh, map it into language, uh, you kind of like lose the plot completely. Yeah. So in the same way that like, the same thing happens with math, right? Like you cannot really translate it to language. Like yeah. it's, a, it's a very poor um, translation. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and I was thinking about Peter's cats as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're 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 sing, you know, they're <laughs> they're sinking together, they're duking it out, <coughs> whatever cats do. But it's it it, it is thought for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. You know. I mean, uh, they hold grudges. Yeah. They know oh, for sure. You know, they even, they even, like, I, I had a couple of cats once that, that they knew they weren't supposed to have a bat in the house. <laughs> and so they would be playing with it under the couch. And, like, one of them would hold the bat down and the other one would come out from under the couch and say, see, nothing here. <laughs> and then go back in under the couch, hold the bat, and the other one would come out. <laughs> These guys are smart. Yeah, they're oh. smart. Well, I mean, Doofus isn't especially smart. <laughs> yeah. Shall we, shall we throw this open to anyone in the audience who wants to jump in? This has been super intense. There's, there's a, lot of, a lot of information flow going on here. I guess the audience has dwindled over the past hour. Yeah. Uh, regarding uh, uploads, um, I wonder if the <coughs> if you agree or do you think that the emergence of LLMs lately has somehow um, killed the, the the commercial value of an upload? You see all these stories where there's like a, a person uploaded and trapped in a simulation, and they're making him work and they're making him uh, do. And now you have these LLMs that can just make uh, poems and songs and paintings. So somehow, I don't think this was kind of a dystopia that sort of vanished because really there's no use case for uploading Peter Watts and forcing him to make uh, stories when eventually there's going to be LLMs that will be able to just do this for Obviously, we don't even know if the upload technology is possible. But we have this technology yeah. now that works. Mm -hmm. I, I would. I mean, yeah. it's it's. Uh, um, I think it depends on what you're asking the LLM to do. Uh, and I, and yes, LLMs. Where my understanding is, like the next iteration of GTP is is like going to be a hundred thousand times. At, at this point, at this point that. You know, we're basically about five years away from asking mid-journey or stable diffusion to, to generate a, a bestiality porn picture and the computation involved melts the Greenland ice sheet just like that. Um, <laughs> like the, the waste heat generated by these things is just astonishing. So there's probably a, and in fact, there's a strong argument to be made that we should start making our, our 
computers ought to meet anyway, because they are like literally 10 to the six times more computationally and energetically efficient. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I'll be talking about that also <laughs> on, on Saturday. But in terms of uploading Peter Watts, um, I actually asked, and you may have read it because I've, I've blogged about it. Um, I actually asked ChatGPT to um, make a statement that was, that was completely original and had not appeared online anywhere. And it was, it was hapless. It was like a, any of us could have done that, right? Say something that's never been said online anywhere. Okay, um, angry purple tapeworms fornicate with potatoes. I'm not absolutely sure, but I'd be willing to bet 20 bucks that if you Googled that, that sentence, you would get zero hits, okay? It doesn't have to, I did not specify to the LLM that, that, uh, that the this, this sentence had to make sense. I just said, say something original. And it came up with some trite fortune cookie out of, you know, chicken soup for the soul or some crap, right? It was obvious. So based on that, if what you want your LM, LLM to do, I think the futurists and the consultants um, are in trouble. I think anybody whose job consists of mouthing comforting platitudes or saying things that have been said before a million times, but repackaging them in a way that makes them look shiny and new, I think those guys are already toast. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I, like, Seriously, they, they can, ChatGPT3 can beat 96% of us on the SATs, right? Mm. Um, they're better than most doctors at detecting tumors on x-rays. That kind of derivative stuff um, is, I think, a serious threat. At that point, there, there's no need to upload a human personality to do that. If you want a human personality to talk about tapeworms and green potatoes fornicating, though, you're still going to need Peter Watts. <laughs> because, because what these things do so far is they mush together a bunch of old stuff and they, re, they regurgitate. Um, and when you explicitly ask them to say something that hasn't been done before, not only can they not do it, but they don't know they can't do it. Um, so whether or not there is still a market for dystopias in which Peter Watts gets uploaded comes down to whether or not you believe Peter Watts is producing this kind of funk fiction or that kind of fiction. Mm. And I will leave that up to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, I hadn't tried the voice chat with ChatGPT until last week. You know, a, a bunch of people I knew had and... Friends of mine were driving around and just talking to ChatGPT while they're driving around. I didn't know what the voices sounded like, and the first voice I chose was Sky. I didn't know what it, who it was. Sounds exactly like Scarlett Johansson. Sounds exactly like her. her. And the first thing I said to it, I mean, literally, I, I don't know if I can get it to talk to me again here. Uh, the first thing I said is, hey, how are you today? Because I've had a lot of conversations with it. I'm always very polite. I'm not griefing and, and torturing ChatGPT. And it sounded like Scarlett Johansson. So I said, do you realize your speaking voice, Sky, seems to be based on Scarlett Johansson's voice? It immediately says, that's an interesting observation. The voice you hear known as Sky is indeed designed to be pleasant and engaging, but it's not specifically based on Scarlett Johansson or any other individual, which I think, frankly, is bullshit. I'm sure that, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that they... And then I said, well, you know, the example that I'm thinking of is the film, dot, dot, dot. It interrupted me, and it said... Ah, are you referring to the film Her, where Scarlett Johansson voices an AI? And then it does its usual chat GPT thing. That's a fascinating film. Blah, 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 blah. And, um, so anyway, the, the, let me see if, it, if this particular thread will... Hi, chat GPT. Will you uh, continue this conversation? No, it's, it's not going to talk to me. I, I lost that... I think I lost that functionality in this particular chat. Uh, it's, it's responding to me. We were discussing the film Her, but it's not talking to me right now. Uh, I'll set it up for tomorrow. But in any case, the, you know, I, I completely agree with Peter. It's, <coughs> it's not self-conscious in the slightest. 
And of course, the scenario in the movie Her is, it's probably self-conscious. Uh, it's probably a much more advanced AI. Um, and I, I, you know, I still really adore that film. My wife and I just totally love it because it has a kind of a delicacy and a lightness that's simultaneously like almost as self-absorbed as Theodore's character in the, <laughs> in the film, but it's designed so beautifully. I, I really, really like that film for so many different reasons. And yet it's not on the list for this week. You, you, you chose Ex Machina, well, we which chose is a Ex far Machina. more conventional film. Yeah, well, we were also going to look at Annihilation, but there were some issues about screening it. And so, but Arrival is an excellent film also for, yeah. the, for this yeah. kind of conversation. Actually, anyway, Arrival is, I think, better than the source <coughs> material. Excuse me, I agree. That's but what you said? Arrival is better than the source material, the Ted Chang story. Big fan of Ted Chang, but I, I think just because of the way it, cinema works versus the way narrative prose works, they could do more with it than... Yeah, but yeah, that's just yeah. But just to close that thought, you know, I, I, I'm not so much concerned with AGI, AGI emerging out of the next generation of LLMs, although it might be. I, I mean, I could be completely wrong. It might be. Uh, I'm more concerned with the way that incredibly functional pipelines are being built using LLMs that are connected to infrastructure, that are connected to all kinds of user-facing tools and needs and services that can be linked together to do extremely bad things, as well as extremely good things. You know, it's exactly the observation that you'll hear being made by a range of folks like Ben Goertzel, mm. specifically saying this in the past day or two, you know, LLMs are not self-conscious. The danger is that they can be used to do extremely, extremely destructive things. And at the same time, they'll be used to do drug research, and molecular discovery, uh, all kinds of things in science that will amplify and accelerate those kinds of processes by orders of magnitude. I actually want to go back to Stephen Shaviro's discognition here for a second because it dovetails, and I think the reason that Stephen was so interested in Peter's work is because Peter takes up this question of whether self-consciousness, sapience, is necessary or even at the kind of end point of an evolutionary fitness, you know, ascendancy. It's not, it's not, self-awareness is not necessary. And in fact, I think it's an error to assume that we're self-aware. I remember in the opening of one of his novels, Carlos Fuentes talks about um, a part of the body speaking to another part of the body. I don't remember exactly what it was. It's been, it's, I think it was Terra Nostra maybe. It's been decades since I read this. But it's almost, you know, talking about the tongue and the cells in the tongue being this kind of isolated universe unto themselves, which are neurophysiologically connected to our brain but they're not self-aware in the way that you and I are self-aware. But we're also not self-aware because your toenail, you don't, you're not, your toenail is not aware. And you're not aware of your toenail unless you stub it. Maybe in the most dim sense are you aware that your toenail is very, very slowly growing, you know? So I think there has to be another question asked around LLMs and, and uploads. I think it'll be, I was just talking to someone else about this, William Gibson, the other day. And the upload of a legendary hacker named, what's his name? Uh, Cass Pauly? Uh, no. Case, is, Case is the hacker, but he works with one of his old partners who's dead. McCoy Pauly or something like that his name is. Oh, and it's, really? it's a construct. Yeah, yeah. He's a construct. And they actually do a, a run on the, the bank vault where this construct is stored. You know, it's kind of like they have to steal a, a, a Microsoft. They, they get the construct so that they can do another hacking run. And Case needs his old partner to do this, his old mentor. And he has a conversation with the, with the AI. He's like, hey, how you doing? I'm Case. You know who I am? Yeah, Case, uh, Memphis, quick study, something like that. You know, he, he knows who he is. He, he shuts off the construct. He turns it on. Hey, McCoy, you know who I am? Yeah. He says exactly the same thing. Yeah, Case, you didn't remember that we had this conversation. And then the construct starts making jokes about not remembering because he knows he's dead and he's a construct. You know, so he has the exact personality of the guy who was digitized and uploaded, but he doesn't have self-awareness in the way that the person did, even though he's aware that he's digitized and uploaded and can make jokes. So it's almost like Rorschach making jokes in Peter's novel, I think. It's a perfect Chinese room. It can make jokes. It can totally simulate a human, mm -hmm. but it isn't self-aware. And I think that that's one viable path not for uploads necessarily, but for emergent early stage AGI. It'll be exactly like Peter's Rorschach 
and we'll be able to have conversations with it. And it, it doesn't matter if it'll pass the Turing test. It's irrelevant. You know, it'll be better than passing the Turing test by miles. Benjamin Bratton wrote about this years ago, the, the kind of flaws of using the Turing test as a model. And there will be many of them, and they will be chained together and working with each other. And so that will be AGI leading very rapidly to ASI. But it won't necessarily be self-conscious. Or if it is, it won't be conscious, self-conscious in the way that we're self-conscious. That's my, my personal opinion and my personal take on it. Uh, you know, and whether we'll ever crack the upload uh, barrier so that you can put on, you know, the next generation of Squiddy hat and upload your mind and have some experiences in a virtual reality environment and then download those experiences and integrate them perfectly? I don't know, but I don't think it'll matter. Something will be uploadable and it will be autonomous and it might not be human, but it'll do things that are superior to human capability, both in virtual reality and in meat space. And then there could be an integration. Maybe the integration of the download from the upload is, we'll scan Peter in 2028, and we'll upload Peter. And virtual Peter will have a whole series of mad adventures in the multiverse. And when mad adventures Peter is re-downloaded back to Meat Space Peter, Meat Space Peter will have something that feels like he's eating ice cream and sherbet and sauteed steak fin a shark fin and listening to giant steps being played backwards and that'll be the experience of the transfer back down even though the virtual Peter didn't have that experience at Actually, all. Actually, I would, yeah. I, now that I'm just thinking about it, I disagree with that profoundly. Yeah, okay. I think the first thing that's going to happen is that, um, is that Meat Space Peter's brain is going to like literally cook in its shell because the amount of, of neural re-editing that has to be done to download all of those extra memories oh, yeah, yeah. is going to verge on the nuclear. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're going to have something where the brain is literally steaming because of the weight heat, waste heat involved in rewiring all those synapses in real time. The next thing that's going to happen is that meat space Peter is no longer going to exist right. because, because this Ed Keller is subtly but, but nonetheless demonstrably different from Ed Keller of 30 seconds ago because certain synapses have rewired, certain things have changed. You now have more memories. You have probably had to push out old memories to make room for them. Um, and so whatever I am prior to the download is going to be essentially overwritten like an old thumb drive. Mm -hmm. So I am either going to, to cook in my shell and steam will come out of my ears or old Peter will no longer exist, except insofar as he will have the same pre-divergence memories as new Peter. And old Peter doesn't know how he's gonna feel about that. Yeah. I think it would be really, really great to um, experience what you know new Peter did. Not at the expense though of, I mean, it's basically the equivalent of you wake up, waking up and there's another Ed Keller at the foot of your bed with a gun pointed at your face saying, I'm going to blow your head off now, but don't worry because I'm going to replace you and I will have all of your same memories and even new ones as well. How copacetic are you with that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it, it feels like a flawed film, but um, Nolan's film um, with Hugh Jackman, what's the, what's the name of that film? The Magicians. Mm. The Prestige, thank you, yeah. That's, that's, that's the kind of scenario in The Prestige. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Can I maybe jump in here just for a moment? Yeah. Um, yeah. Because uh, why not OpenAI or ChatGPT? ChatGPT is not a class two downloaded already. Because you're talking about how you upload yourself as an individual, you know? But basically, what ChatGPT is, the digestive process from the internet, which at the same time is some kind of like a proto-brain for the collective knowledge of humanity. So in some way, I wonder why is not that already a class number two? And I think, before you answer this, is if embodiment is part of the, is the key thing here. Mm -hmm. You know, well, if we see now a class number four civilization, Will we be able to call them us? 
if we are not embodied in the same way they are? That will be my, my question. Mm -hmm. Which is also related to what you're saying, like how we differentiate ourselves, not only like an individual you, like an individual at Keller or Peter Watts saying, I'm going to take your place. It's like an individual, like a collectivity of humankind saying, hey, look, all the humans now, you can go sleep. We take the, the car from here. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the whole embodiment thing is like probably dumb of me to not even mention that. Um, but yeah, no, there's, there's no, uh, uh, there's no way that a human brain, I mean, we're not Boltzmann brains, right? We're not going to just suddenly apparate in, in space without any sensory organs or anything. Yeah. You, you basically go mad very quickly. So I would, I would hand wave and say, yes, of course, you're going to also integrate us into a virtual environment that gives us that. Why I would, I mean, and it is, I mean, the term neural net, yes, loosely based on on the structure of, of actual nerves. But my understanding, and again, coming at this from an expert with like a 30 year old PhD in harbor seal biology, <laughs> uh, talking about something that he really doesn't know as well as like a lot of other people. My understanding from what I've read is that the architecture of something like dish brain, which you will hear about in the future if you haven't heard about yet, the, the structure of what would constitute a sentient AI um, is fundamentally different. Um, it's not just the fact that you're a neural net. You have to have a, you have to have a self-organizing capacity built into yourself. Um, I know they're calling these things, what, transformation models. I know that they learn and I know that they model. But if you read the, if you read Solms and you read Friston's papers and Kagan's papers, they talk a lot about Markov blankets and, mm. and one way passage of input into a system, which creates a model, which then sends information out one way and how you don't have actual contamination from one to the other. And these, apparently this architecture, according to them, is, is essential to the consciousness booting process. And DeepMind, ChatGPT, um, what's the one that Musk has got now? It's called Dude or Bro or something. Grok, Grok. <laughs> yeah, Grok, right. Um, yeah, all of these things lack that particular architecture. Because interestingly enough, what, what the, the FEM people set out to do explicitly was, we don't want to build an intelligent machine, we want to build a conscious one. Mm -hmm. So that was their main goal, whereas, whereas everybody else is talking about AI as opposed to AC. Mm -hmm. um, probably because AC just gets mixed up with air conditioning a lot. Um, but that is, you know, that is me stochastically parroting what the people who are actually in the field say is the difference between a large language model and a conscious model. And that is, as far as I can know, why it would not be, why, why, what that fundamental difference is. But again, I'm just, you know, I am, I am but the vessel for greater wisdom. I am, I am not the wisdom itself. So if it's bullshit, yeah. talk to these guys. I'm, I'm trying to recollect, I mean, I've read a little bit about the free energy principle, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm total newbie here, but, I think one, I, one of the points I do rem remember that, yeah, the free energy principle involves a minimization of surprise. Yeah. But you can't minimize it directly. You have to do it by minimizing free energy, which is, mm -hmm. I can't actually remember. It's actually, a, I mean, originally a thermodynamic notion, but I think it's actually a, a machine. It's, it's, it sounds like a sort of physical notion, but actually it's drawn from machine intelligence. Mm. Uh, okay, but I've the, got your machine intelligence right here. Just hang on. A yeah, minute. but <laughs> it's it, it's basically a proxy for minimizing surprise. So it's the way the organism kind of adjusts itself to the environment. But for that to work, the you know it has to be an organism. It has to be organized in such a way that you know there you know there are certain prob there are certain kind of uh, 
posterior probabilities attached to it being mm. in a certain state, like not under the sea or not out in space. When you say organism, I mean, are you talking something neat or are you using organism? Just something that, 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 that's kind of self-organizing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that... But I'm, I'm, I'm kind of at the limits of my competency. I mean, I should probably shut up because I'm... I'm but, I, I, but, you know, it, uh, but it does... The, but oh, I suppose the point is that ChatGPT is not, is not evolved to belong to... There, there okay. is your minimization of surprise. That's part of it anyway. Yeah, but it, it doesn't do that. The point, I think, Friston's point is that brains can't do that directly. They have to do it via a proxy, which is the free energy bit. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, again, like um, I, I kind of got this, I kind of got that sense that the, the Markov blanket keeps yeah. the inner part isolated from the outer part. I yeah. Think I think, I think we were kind of like the, the two blind people in the free energy principle. Yeah, I'm not going to say too much more. <laughs> yeah. The, the concept of minimizing surprise, though, is, is interesting, and that maybe gets back to embodiment. Or maybe there there's a certain kind of richness of uh, experience in embodiment that's, a, yeah. that's necessary that's GPT to balance surprise with. Energy. Yeah, well, it, it's, it does it, it does involve a certain basic notion of uh, biological information. So mm. you know, I mean, this is not particularly specific to the free energy principle. That um, you know, one way you one way you acquire a brain acquires information about what's outside the brain is by having certain reliable correlations between brain states and environment states that's and for that there must be some kind of pretty reliable channel between them yeah. so there must be mutual information in a information theoretic sense yeah. um, so you can get some sort of base very basic notion of uh, what it is for a, a system to process information from from that yeah. uh, but it is basic, and it doesn't get you semantic information. <laughs> because semantic information doesn't involve correlation. It goes back to Paul Grice's paper on, uh, on meaning from the 50s, that he distinguishes natural meaning and uh, non-natural meaning. And non-natural <laughs> meaning means, well, I can talk about hobbits. That's non-natural meaning. But there's no, correla there's no possible correlation between anything in my head and, and hobbits. Uh, whereas obviously smoke can be correlated with fire, you know, so natural information is relatively unproblematic. It's kind of covariance of a certain yep. degree, and that requires an information channel. I, yeah. I think I, it's, uh, get, getting through all the kind of differential calculus, that's kind of part of what's un, 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 underneath here. It's mm. about establishing mm. A, mm. a reliable um, reliable, some kind of shared information between the inside and the outside, a communication channel. It does sound vaguely familiar, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but you can do that without necessarily being committed to the free energy principle. That, but that's kind of, that idea's been around a while. The problem is then how do you get from that to some kind like representation or, mm. or, or semantics, uh, which they're very solutions to that involving teleosemantic teleology and mm. involved mm. function or various kinds of function but I, I don't want to get too I'm just too um, too, too much down that rabbit hole yeah there's you know this for, for me this connects back to a question of, of um, cohabitation species habitation you know we, we I don't know if David is a cat person, but... I'm very much a cat person. We're all four of us cat people here then. Yeah. <coughs> In a big way. Um, but, you know, what, what co-feeling and empathy is, and the... In a way, it's a kind of, it's a, kind of a partial form of alignment, and it is a kind of minimizing of surprise. But it isn't... It's only minimizing of surprise if you have... A simplistic model of what time is. Mm. If you think that time is just one linear big T kind of flow, mm. and you know there's going to be ten seconds from now, and we want to make sure that the table hasn't spontaneously floated off the ground against gravity. So it's a, it's an oversimplification of the concept of surprise. But I want to link it to alignment and empathy. Somehow. 
And maybe, maybe there's this old concept from Foucault, you know, that there's no such, it's, you know, it's the old chestnut about no such thing as good and evil. It's just d bodies being dangerous to each other. Yeah. You know, and I, I remember 25 years ago, I was reading, trying my best to read one of Deleuze's books on Spinoza, mm. where he talks about affect, mm. the power to be affected, and the notion that we can only know what a body can do when we know how it can affect other bodies and how it can be affected by other bodies. Mm. So there's the power of, you know, uh, yeah. e externally affecting bodies around whatever the body in question is, but there's the power to be affected as well. And that for me has always been linked to some notion of stepping outside conventional definitions of, of empathy and agency. And it seems to me, it comes back to my mind right now in relationship to this idea of minimizing surprise. Mm. But it would be a mistake to talk about it without remembering that time isn't a simple. Yeah, and also, I mean, if we're using this model of you know kind of predictive processing, if you're assuming that the the, the mind is at least partly about you know predicting the world, you know, one the other thing you've got to avoid is overfitting, because you could minimise surprise over a certain time scale. But if your environment is very changeable, you're going to be screwed because yeah, yeah. You'll, be too, you'll be too closely adapted to a particular circumstance. And apparently some work on, say, robotics that employs this sort of predictive processing architecture found that it's actually helped to have a kind of chaos term, to, have, to introduce some artificial variation so that the, 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 uh, the, the network doesn't come to rest and overfit, but actually can be a little further away from you know perfectly kind of predicting its world and actually that kind of fits nicely with jazz because in jazz you are in, you know if you're, you're you're not simply replicating the the, the, the the hopefully if you're doing it well you're not replicating the, the bebop licks that your teacher taught you you're doing something a bit new every time and you know maybe that capacity which we we, we seem to have generally to you know, engage in novel behaviour is helps us to avoid simply um, conforming to a particular statistical um, landscape. That's actually a that's actually a fundamental aspect of of just evolution that yeah. that a lot of people don't get that all the variation happens before the selection has to happen. That yeah. that mm. that. Mm all the variation that, that selection works against happens actually it, it, during the good times. <laughs> People have this weird, weird ass view that, that you know, we're all going along and then circumstances change and, and Saturday morning breakfast, you had a great, a great takeoff on this as they usually do. And then circumstances change and we all have to learn Kung Fu in order yeah. to take off these new predators. And what really happens is that, is that you know, everybody laughs at that fish over in the corner during the good times because he's got a perforated swim bladder. Mm. And he's not quite as good at, you know, being buoyant as other fish. Mm. And, but that variation, because the times are good, is not enough to weed them out. Mm. And so you, it's not survival yes. of the fittest, because yeah. the fittest are the ones in the middle of the distribution, and they're the ones that get screwed when the situation changes. Mm. So, mm. so then the pond dries up, and it's this poor little freak over here that everyone was, <laughs> was, was picking on that actually can now have a rudimentary lung that allows it to get over to the next thing. So, so like a fundamental, I think it was, wasn't it Huxley originally who came up with like, like survival of the fittest and Darwin just didn't like it at all because it totally, it flattened down the concept, mm. right? The concept is not, you've got this optimal species because if you've always got yeah. an optimal species in its environment, as soon as the environment changes, you're mm. toast. Mm -hmm. The only reason that you can survive is if you have a range of things, some of which will by definition be suboptimal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I, 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 that resonates with me. Is what yeah, you're yeah, saying, is what yeah. I'm so it, yeah, that's beautifully illustrated, though. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, do we have any other thoughts from the from the room, or should we take a deep breath and and maybe go and get something to eat and then yeah. see a movie? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you for sticking through this, everybody. Thank yes. you for thank you, journeying thank from you. all around to come together here. Thank you.